who are watching the live stream and uh, probably at different hours of the night. So what I want to do is uh, do a, a quick spiel on the, the FreeBSD Foundation, uh, what we do, and really what we do to help support the FreeBSD project and all of you folks. I do have some of my team members up here who are also going to talk about the various areas that they support. And so, um, so I'm going to try to be really quick. But I do want to tell you about who we are. And uh, we were founded uh, 23 years ago, actually by Justin Deb, who is way up on top. There, he's also our president. Uh, we're a 501c3, which is a US tax uh, classification. And it means we're for the, pub, the um, public good, and we're um, a true nonprofit. And um, and so we are funded 100% by donations. And uh, Emma, we're uh, based in Boulder, Colorado. So actually, Justin and I are both from Boulder, uh, but we have team members and board members from all around the world. So our purpose. There's a lot of words up here, I know, but uh, but basically, what I wanted to convey was. Uh, we are here to serve you, and, um, and you are the community of FreeBSD. So we support the community as well as the project, at, which is the actual computer operating system. And the community is everyone who contributes and uses FreeBSD. So whether you're writing documentation or creating these awesome YouTube videos or writing code or testing to find bugs, fixing bugs, all those different things, um, make up this amazing community. And if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have anything we do. Well, we plan out work. Uh, so anyway, so our purpose is to step in <laughs> and uh, fix, you know, fill in critical needs of the project and, um, and just important, um, you know, ways to really help keep uh, FreeBSD relevant as well as the platform that we all know is the best for, um, you know, education and research and products and, and all different types of uses. So this is you and what one thing I would like to ask you, this, this is a picture of us um, in a working group in Sweden uh, quite a few years ago and we were actually uh, trying to brainstorm ideas on how we could recruit uh, you folks to the project and so uh, it was a great way for us just to get together people from all over the world, different ideas and, um, and interests in how we can bring on new people. And so I know that there's uh, fairly new people to the project here. There's also people who've been around for a long time, actually, since the beginning. Um, we sometimes refer to them as dinosaurs, but, and <laughs> but I mean, they're awesome. And the thing is, Isn't the preferred term graveyard? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, but the thing is, is especially like these um, these old timers, these people who've been around for a long time. Um, you know, you may look up uh, up at them as rock stars, but they are so approachable. And so, if you're new to the project, uh, feel free to go up and and meet them and talk to them, and ask them questions. And for you folks who've been around for a long time, find the new faces, reach out to new people, and ask them questions. Why, you know, why are they here? Why do they want to contribute to FreeBSD? And this is a way for us to learn and, um, and also how to just improve the project and get more people to join. So um, this is our team of, of folks. These are all of our uh, full-time staff members. Uh, most of these people are here. And um, I do have their titles if you read them, uh, just so you know that um, if you have any questions, if you need any help, you can reach out to someone in that specific area. We will have a table during the conference, and so you can come over and talk to us. And I think the only two people on here who are not here, uh, Kostik is not able to attend, and uh, uh, Lauren Gutowski, who many of you have communicated with uh, over email, uh, she's also, she wasn't able to attend. And then our board of directors, and these are the folks who help us with our um, defining our vision and our future and what we, you know, what the big picture of what we should do, as well as uh, fiduciary responsibility for the foundation. And so just to give you um, just highlights of, of the areas that we support, and this isn't all that we do, but really these are the areas that um, affect the folks here more. And, um, 
So software development, we implement new features and functionality for the fund. Uh, we do a lot of free VIP advocacy, uh, sometimes referred to as marketing, but really the whole purpose is to promote free VIP. And um, Ann will go into more detail on what we're doing there. Uh, we have folks on the security team. We also have a full-time employee who uh, works on continuous integration, Lee Lynn, who's up, up there. Um, it's like, can I fit in down here? Uh, we also are a legal entity, so we're able to represent the project with um, agree, you know, signing license agreements, um, NDAs. We own the, the free VSD trademark, so that includes the logo, and also can provide legal guidance too, especially like when the core team has questions or legal type of questions. Uh, partnerships is a new area, and I mean, so we've worked with uh, companies uh, over time, I mean, that's how we get a lot of our funding, uh, but we actually brought in a full-time person to work with um, really improving and enhancing those relationships and um, and working more closely with some of those uh, donors or uh, large corporations. And then finally, we uh, plan and uh, run these types of events, and especially over the pandemic, we were able to run these virtual summits and um, and it really did provide uh, an avenue for uh, folks to connect. I mean, most of us were just connected and we were all over the world. And so it was really a way to to connect even though it was you know, on the computer, um, but, you, but there were a lot of people who were able to attend these summits who, who don't travel anyway. And so they felt like they were part of the community. So uh, so we do that, we're gonna be doing more in person. And then also we do meet with uh, large uh, previous users, uh, companies, universities, and uh, and find out from them, like, how are you using FreeBSD? What are your challenges? And it helps us um, understand what the needs are for the project. And then we provide that information uh, mostly to the core team. And also it helps uh, give us direction on what we're going to do. So I do, so most of my team members actually are going to cover this in their slides of, of how we can help you. Um, and really, and the thing with how you can support us. And, and really, it's, uh, you know, let us tell your story, especially for companies. Uh, also for individuals too, we want to share your stories too, and um, and then also donations. So we're um, always happy to accept your donations, and that's what helps uh, fund our work. So next up will be Ann Dickinson, and she will talk about us. hear me? Yes. I will try to be brief. Uh, so, quick rundown about what we do to advocate for the project. Um, we create materials to help folks getting started. So we have how-to guides, we have getting started guides, we have installation guides, we have a series called FreeBC Fridays, which are sort of one-on-one -on -one classes that will start on our YouTube channel. Um, so those are great ways for folks to find a topic that they might not know a lot about and, and learn about that. Uh, we promote the work that we're doing to support the project, but also the work that you're all doing to promote the project. Um, we speak at non-BSD conferences, like uh, State of Open when we were there. Uh, we were also at Scale with a FreeBSD workshop, and that's a good way to either introduce or remind folks about FreeBSD. As uh, I mentioned, we sponsor events like these. Uh, we partner with other marketing, uh, we do marketing partnerships with other organizations like Usenix and Crosslight, so we'll make sure our stuff is in front of their audiences. Um, we create programs and materials to help you spread the word. So on our website, we have an entire um, resources page under the marketing section with flyers you can print and stickers you can print. We do outreach to the media, to student groups, to meetup groups. And of course, we produce the journal, normally online. Uh, this is a great issue, by the way. Uh, the editorial board did a great job, so I highly recommend picking one up. Poetry is pretty cool, too. Um, 
We have some upcoming events. We are going to be at Flossy in Portland, which is sort of a replacement for Oxcon. Uh, we sort of have a previously workshop, uh, hosted at the table and with help. We'll be at Eero. We're going to be at Women of Courage in Norway, which is an ACM women in computing conference. Um, and we will have a table and we're a sponsor of All Things Open, which is a very Linuxy conference. So it's great to have a previously present there to remind folks that there's more than one type of open source operating system. And what are we doing going forward? Well, we're going to be doing more articles about how the project works. Uh, we've done articles on how Sec Team works. We're hopefully going to do a sports article in a way to sort of showcase how FreeBSD works differently than other open source operating systems. Cool, cool project. Um, and of course, we do promote the work that we're doing and that you're doing when you do that. Uh, we want to have more informational materials that are about the benefits about using FreeBSD, so not just how to use EFS, but why. Uh, more introductory workshops to things like Flossy and All Things Open. Uh, and as Deb mentioned, we really want to tell your story. Telling stories is, is just so important to tell, talk about why you use FreeBSD, how you got started, how it's impacted your career. Um, so we'll be doing that via our website and our social media. Um, and then we have a new PR firm, which we're pretty excited about, and we are gaining more media interest that way. We're meeting with analysts, um, so we are making sure that when we are discussing operating systems and open source operating systems, that they're talking about FreeBSD too. And then how you can help, uh, you know, help us spread the word. You can present at conferences like Fossey or All Things Open. We can help you submit a talk. You can go to local meetups and you can do presentations there. We can help you with that. Um, you know, talk about why you use FreeBSD if your colleagues don't use FreeBSD. That would be great. Uh, I talked about the stickers and flyers on our website. Uh, we also have a resources page under the FreeBSD section on our website that has all of the getting started materials. It has community resources. There's a lot of those who do great YouTube videos, tutorials that way. Um, and finally, if your company uses FreeBSD, we'd love for you to do a testimonial. Um, it's a great way to showcase what your company is doing and also show folks how FreeBSD can be beneficial to an organization. So um, you can go to our website to find that out or you can come see me uh, or Deb or other folks here who will get you in the right direction to do a testimonial. So that is sort of the advocacy section, and I will now hand it off to, I believe, Greg, our new, uh, I think Greg's next. I think so. Yeah, Greg. Let's see. Uh, yes. Uh, our new person. So thank you all very much. Sound all right? Yep. Cool. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Greg Wallace. I met some of you, um, many of you, but not all of you, and I'm very excited to be here. So uh, as both Deb and Anne said, I'm, I'm new. Uh, I'm about six weeks, I think, five and a half weeks into the job. Um, but I did have the privilege of uh, freelancing with uh, the foundation from 2019 to 2020. I got to know a bunch of you uh, through that work. So I'm really excited to be part of the foundation full time. So, just a bit about me so you kind of know who I am and what I'm going to be up to. Um, so, I've been around tech since 92. My first job was in technology policy, um, and I just loved it. Uh, I'm not an engineer by training, but I, I love the um, spirit of improving uh, that was so pervasive within technology. And personally, I just love to learn. And so, uh, as I'm sure is the case with all of you, you know, you're always learning. There's always more to learn, and that's what's really kept me in technology all these years. Um, I've been around open source since 2004 and really fell in love with it, um, with uh, the, you know, the passion of people who are involved in open source, with the spirit of community, um, and uh, so I haven't been in open source continuously since then, but it's always been a part of what I've been doing, whether I've been at technology companies that build on top of open source or uh, from like from 2015 to 2018, I was very involved with um, a number of uh, foundations that were part of the Linux Foundation, one that was prior to joining DLF called the jQuery Foundation and then a bunch at the Linux Foundation. Um, so that's just a bit about me so you kind of know who, who I am. Uh, I'm sort of a marketing, business development person, mostly by training. So what I'll be focused on are really four things, but I think with a 
sort of heavy emphasis on the top two partnerships and research. So from partnerships, I'm going to be uh, really focused on uh, just getting to know the ecosystem uh, of, of users and you know, users are end users, right? Of which there are plenty, but there are also tech companies that build with uh, FreeBSD. And just getting to know them, understanding their challenges, understanding their goals, and um, making sure that we are uh, being as maximally supportive as we possibly can be. Um, I think of research as very complementary to that because uh, you know, there are really, really big conversations happening around the world as we speak, as we sit in this room, on topics of security, on topics of uh, performance, um, you know, uh, big government initiatives, some of which present huge opportunities, some of which present potential risks. So many of you may be familiar with the Cyber Resiliency Act that was passed by the EC and that many in the open source community are quite concerned about because of the uh, liability that open source contributors may face. Um, so, you know, it's important that the FreeBSD uh, community be part of those conversations. And so that's going to be part of what I will be doing. Um, and uh, education uh, is really about just, you know, making sure that Ann and I are collaborating to um, develop the materials that will help uh, new people be successful with FreeBSD. And I think you know, my focus is going to be principally around the commercial ecosystem uh, and their needs, but not exclusively. Um, so what am I really, really focused on five and a half weeks into the job um, in order from left to right? I really just want to learn. I want to learn uh, you know, how, um, how I can sort of be the voice within the foundation to make sure that the, uh, the ecosystem of users and vendors uh, are as successful as they possibly can be. Um, and you know, part of the research aspect that I didn't mention previously is there are a lot of government grants out there that FreeBSD could, is relevant to. Um, and so part of my role is going to be making sure that we are positioning ourselves to win uh, parts of, you know, more than our fair share, hopefully, of, of those grants. And there's a lot of money, I think, but um, that we could really leverage to sort of be the, the salt that adds flavor to the emerging FreeBSD community. Um, I think I already touched on the points in the middle about increasing reach through sort of putting the FreeBSD uh, voice into all the relevant conversations that are happening. And then on the education side, it's really, as I said, helping to create new professional uh, courses so people can get certified. So all of the companies that are hiring FreeBSD developers can find them more easily. Um, you know, refreshing and scoping out some undergraduate curriculum material. And lastly, exploring some grant opportunities that may be able to fund some of that education as well. So that's it. That's me. Um, really excited to meet all of you over the course of the next couple of days, but you'll seek me out, and yeah, best luck. And I think next up is projects. I'm gonna hand it off to Joe. Thanks, Brad. Oh, yeah, I think your Slack is just a step out there. Oh, I can't see it. I, I can't see it on here. Oh, okay. How's that? Can you hear me okay? Take this in, you take that in. Cheers. Always a good time. So 
for anybody on the live stream or has some technical issues. <laughs> well, they've just been watching from the camera, which doesn't really pick up the uh, projector very well. <laughs> Green light, broken. I've already lost the depth, so I'll copy the slide. So you can clear it. Make sure you didn't make the post. Oop, I screwed it. We got what we got. <laughs> yep, great. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to uh, let everybody everybody know what the uh, technical team at the foundation has been up to lately. So I will start with a very quick and dirty way of summarizing development, and that's through uh, commit logs. So um, the plot on the left is uh, a breakdown of uh, foundation-sponsored commits since the beginning of 2022, and it's it, it breaks them down over the three different repositories. And I think there's two kind of key points you can make here. The first is that just generally uh, the work continues. I mean, we have a little variation, but overall it's uh, steady contributions. And I think the second point that's, that's worth making is that um, most of our focus has been on the source tree. That may change with our recent hire of a, of a user land developer. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Um, the, the donut plot on the right is a breakdown of all sponsored commits to the source repository over the last year. And again, I think there's, there's two key points that I'd like to make. The first is that uh, the foundation is a major contributor. And the second thing is that um, there's a lot of color here. So a lot of different uh, entities are supporting work in the source tree. And, and that's nice to see, and I think it's healthy for the project. Um, and so these are the people that are, are full-time staff on the technology team at, at the foundation. Um, <clears throat> I think most of these faces are, or their names are familiar to most of us here, um, especially Ed. So Ed uh, heads up the team. Um, it would probably be easier for me to list the things that Ed doesn't do rather than what he does. <laughs> so let me see. Um, Lots of direct development work, served on the core team, security team. Uh, I, I was reminded last night the, the journal editorial team. Uh, lots of mentoring, answers all our questions at the foundation, so Ed does a whole lot. Uh, Caustic is another name. If you follow the commit logs, you certainly see uh, Kib's uh, username quite often. So Kib is kind of known for taking on the really challenging technical problems, finding rather the really challenging. Uh, bugs. Uh, Lee Wen um, <coughs> uh, serves on the core team, has commit bits in all the repositories. I think Lee Wen, your focus lately has been a lot of, a lot of mentoring and, and working on our CI. Um, I'm a project coordinator, so my main role is to interact with people who want to contract with the foundation. Uh, I dabble in the Forbes tree. I try to contribute other ways, like I'm administering and mentoring for GSOP. Um, I've started making the uh, rare commits to the other repositories. And then a face that might not be as familiar to everyone is, is Pierre's. Um, so Pierre is our new user land software developer. Uh, Pierre comes from our sibling project, the NetBSD project. and. Uh, I think if I could summarize what Pierre is going to do is try to smooth out any rough edges for people that are installing and running FreeBSD. Um, your first main task, task has been to uh, work on the import of uh, OpenSSL v3. So we look forward to lots of, of, of nice contributions from Pierre. We're sorry. Into <laughs> <laughs> the fire, right? Yeah, the deep end of the pool. Um, so here's our, our uh, what I call long-term contractor. So everybody here uh, probably knows Mark or knows of his work. I'm not going to try and summarize all the, so I use the term generalist, I think, because Mark works on so many different things in, in the source repository, so many great things. Um, 
So rather than me try to summarize all that, um, I'll just say there's a lot of things that Mark does behind the scenes, a whole lot of mentoring, uh, both interns and key socs. And so Mark is a, is a major, major contributor for the foundation. Um, Bjorn has a contract, he's had a contract for a while to improve uh, the wireless situation on FreeBSD. So I think a lot of that work has been on the Linux KPIs with the goal that you um, basically take these drivers that are developed for Linux, pop them into FreeBSD with little or no modification. And I think it's been set successful in, this, in the sense that we are supporting uh, modern wireless chips, most of them now. Uh, the next stage, uh, which still needs work, is to get those speeds that, that, that we should be seeing. So Bjorn has had to take a little bit of a break, but uh, he's gonna be ramping back up. Uh, Mitchell is a former intern with the foundation who uh, uh, does lots of work now. Mitchell, um, yeah, does lots of different things, but certainly specializes in um, uh, improving support for RISC-V hardware. John, uh, as, who uh, I think probably most of us know, has a very uh, kind of focused contract with the foundation to deal with um, uh, beehive security issues as they arise. Um, so here's a few of our, our, our project grants. So uh, Robert is our, our latest contractor and uh, he will be working to uh, add uh, single instruction multi-data to our libc. Uh, Kirk, who everybody probably knows, uh, is working to add uh, the ability to take snapshots for file systems with uh, journal soft updates. Moyne's working with uh, uh, Lee Wen to improve CI. Um, Mina is working on cloud init. Uh, Naman is a uh, CS student at the University of Waterloo, and they will be taking on um, uh, tasks that relate to containers. Uh, Jake's a former GSOC student who will be working with Mark uh, this summer on Capstan issues. Uh, and Wei, uh, was working with uh, Lee Wen and Bjorn on wireless issues. And uh, I think Enway is giving a talk here at BSD 10. So if you want to learn lots about uh, uh, his work, you can attend that. Uh, Chia Shin is uh, working on OpenStack. And Christos uh, is also a former GSOC student. He'll be working with uh, Mark on uh, uh, KINS, their new uh, DTRACE provider. And I just want to remind everyone that uh, we are here to support uh, good work. So if you have project ideas, uh, please talk to us. And uh, yeah, I believe that's okay. Yeah, we should get the, while I get the plans ready, we should get a bunch of people down here, whether they want to be down here or not. <laughs> so, Benedict, we win. Yeah, this is the core team. It's the core team something. <laughs> Thank you. 
Let me make you a cut mark. Mm -hmm. Just keep going. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so here are the folks here who are like four this time. Uh, we just want to talk with a few things about you, and then give time, um, hopefully, for you guys to ask questions on this. Um, Please be kind. Uh, might be a good thing to, to say. Um, is it going to work? Maybe. Oh, come on. Did I beat Paul? I got to beat Paul? That's great. Um, well, while it catches up, you know, I'm not going to let it work. Um, the folks we have here today from our team are Ms. Taylor. And if I say your name wrong, just shout it out instead. Um, Lee Wynn, Benedict, Ed, and myself. Um, also folks serving on the team, and I'll have to read from the slides when Max catches up. Which of the needs to get the camera frozen. Mm -hmm. Just bring it back. Oh, oh, there we go. So that can work. I just can't do the other thing. Um, uh, <laughs> 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 Spoiling the surprise. Yeah, we're all suffering. All fun trials. Surprise is a generous word. Um, <laughs> other folks on our team include Baptiste, uh, Greg Rainey, Emmanuel Rideau, and Tobias Turner. So we also have Sergio uh, serving as our secretary this time. So we wanted to run over just a couple of quick things first, and then we kind of have one deep savage topic that we'll talk about, and then we'll open it up for questions from anybody else after that. Um, so kind of the quick hit things we wanted to just talk about. Um, so this is not necessarily an exhaustive list, but some of the things that we've kind of worked on so far in our current term. Um, the first one is that um, after uh, some false starts and some hiccups, um, we are back to having mostly core reports. So I'm, I, I'm personally very happy that that's working again. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, are, we have recently talked with our Cajole Warner into working with Lewin on restarting, a kind of the, working with the next steps after Git of adjusting our workflow of how we work to bring in contributions, in particular how we work with um, adjusting how we bring in contributions in from outside contributors who aren't already considered the open data industry. Uh, we are, one of the topics we're, we are working on with the foundation is kind of um, making our annual survey that we like to have to kind of get good data about how our community is going year over year. Um, making that a more sustainable process by partnering with the foundation and having them help us with kind of managing, like, the, like ensuring it actually happens every year. And us working with them to help with the content side of it. Um, so just helping that to be a more reliable thing that uh, will happen uh, consistently on a yearly basis. Another change that we have made is that CORE has taken over the kind of reporting side of the code of conduct and dealing with that. Um, we have found through experience that trying to have a separate group of people be the responsible party party for dealing with code of conduct reports just hasn't scaled well with the kind of our organization and our community and the resources that we have. So we need kind of absorb that part of the functionality back into CORE. Um, we, uh, the, the foundation um, sponsored an opportunity for several folks from CORE to meet with a leadership consultant back in December and kind of think about um, some more strategic long-term thoughts about how CORE should operate in particular and how we should interact with the foundation. Um, that's still something that, uh, I think we made really good progress at that meeting this week and learned a lot of things, but we're still kind of chewing on that inside of CORE of, of um, coming to consensus on that and really what the kind of state of the community is going forward about that. Um, and, and how it might adjust how CORE might operate and how what CORE role might be in the future. A couple other things that we've already kind of talked about somewhat on developers um, previously this year is this, some kind of tweaks and adjustments to how we 
manage to get membership. Um, one of them that I think we're still kind of getting the wording right to reflect our, our intent um, is updating our, our kind of way we manage mentoring to ensure that we don't have um, mentees kind of stuck in a hole where they never get out of mentorship either because a mentor goes through the wall um, or if they're just not making board progress, but coming to single, single resolution of those states and not having people stuck in kind of limbo. Um, and also removing some of the distinctions that we kind of have between commitment types uh, and some of the ways that um, that is kind of harm collaboration by being perhaps a bit too stringent than what we really need. So that's our kind of quick list of news. So we wanted to kind of spend a little bit of time talking about one particular topic um, that several members of the team have been focused on and working on this term. It's not the only thing that people are working on, it's, it's not all nine of us are working on it, but it is a particular topic that several have a passion for and been working on, and that we kind of have consensus within our team that we think is a good idea. Um, and then I do want to talk about a vision we have, what we think um, would be really helpful for the project and kind of a more effective way of dealing with some of the communication that we do. So as a project, we have several different methods and forms for communicating um, that we use all sorts of varieties. We historically used mailing lists for a long time and still use them for all sorts of communication. Uh, we have the, the forums. Um, we have IRC and Slack and Discord and Zuma, depending on which conference you go to, um, for food and Telegram and Keybase and probably just like eight other item things that I don't know about or I forgot to mention. Um, and in particular, instant messaging is something that we have a lot of very disparate um, platforms for that's pretty fragmented. Um, many of our platforms also kind of have some divergence. Um, so we have some, some places that more developers hang out versus users, and we don't always necessarily have um, good overlap between those two folks in some of these, some of these places. And some of the, um, well, I guess also uh, other ways that we kind of have divergent audiences is some of our platforms um, have older folks on them, so maybe more senior in the project or, or older just in other ways. Um, since like birthdays, <coughs> some of us are more endowed with birthdays than others. Um, compared to folks who are younger and, and, and might want to use different platforms than us, other people. Uh, I'll put myself in the old category who's getting to be there. Um, and then also, we have some weird quirks. So one of our official channels is called Spark64. Um, I, I don't think it's very clear or intuitive what that really has to do with being a place for FreeBSD developers to talk, um, considering we removed Spark from the trees several years ago. Um, so uh, some of these things are perhaps, um, you know, that one in particular is kind of weird, and I don't know that that's very friendly to new folks to understand why that makes sense. Um, a lot of that is going to be intuitive thing to do. So we have a couple of goals that we would like to do around particularly um, instant messaging and how that works in the project. Uh, one is that we would like to reduce the fragmentation we have in particular. I don't think it's very clear or the platforms that we use for that form of communication. <laughs> Are you sorry, serious? Sorry, John. <laughs> no, that's my fault for not doing this instant step. Instant messaging. No, no. We still have a Well, see, I would have previews turned on, unlike other people who have done that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there, problem is solved. That will not happen again. <laughs> All right, Porter. Uh, <laughs> I'll find that later. Kind of how that works in the project. Um, uh, one is that we would like we to reduce the fragmentation we have. We would like particular very clear tools that we use for that form of this part of our communication work. We would like less fragmentation between our different crowds, if we can. I mean, we, can all, we can't force people to do things, but we would like to have less of it if we, if we could. We would like to find ways to steer users and developers in particular into more shared places where users can talk with developers um, and to, per, to kind of enable more collaboration between kind of existing kind of developer circle and, and especially newer bases. Um, and we would also like to have a platform that's a little more secure and perhaps not plain text, where some conversations we have that we want by their nature to not be public and to be more private um, for obvious reasons. 
It doesn't have the shared control state, but I would use IRC always and forever. And so you guys may be looking for it in case you need comment. Um, in case you need comment about it. And in particular, um, I know we use IRC a lot, and I use IRC a lot. Um, but is it true that compared to especially all the other long list of things that uh, were listed as other IO platforms, many of them have things that are very different compared to IRC. Um, for example, on all the other platforms, you can reliably connect and get whatever scroll back happened while you were sleeping at night uh, without having to do interesting things. Like I use Quaffle for my IRC setup so that I can get backlogged. But if you're on IRC, you have to do some kind of thing to make that happen. It doesn't kind of happen naturally. Like the kind of younger platforms, that's kind of a native feature that's just always there. Um, some people like to use graphical emojis instead of ASCII. And that's not a thing that really happens on IRC. I mean, it's maybe on some clients, but it's not quite a native thing to the platform the way it is pretty much universally on all the non-IRC platforms. Um, and also, um, at least in my experience, like the IRC clients for this is pretty crap compared to the, the ability to get notifications and stuff that works pretty well with almost all the other platforms that one can imagine. Right? If you the experience, I mean, there, there really is different kind of IRC versus everything else from our experience in terms of how all these platforms work. So I know that, yes, somebody is going to be bringing the IRC forever for the end of time. Um, but I don't think that we, at Core, we don't really think that, well, we think that IRC has some limitations. And in particular for our younger crowd, that it's not quite as good as, as other things. So we're not really sure that IRC is the best answer for our, our choice of two platforms, if we're going to have one. So, um, the proposal that we are kind of working through with Core, and it's still a, the clear this is a proposal idea, but it's something that's still being worked out. It's not like a finalized permit decision. It's still we're still working through this. Is we think that the, the project should post a matrix instance. Um, there's a couple of things that we would do. Um, uh, there's a couple of reasons that we think matrix is a is a good choice for us because um, there are lots of varying platforms to choose from. If one thing is open source, um, it is, has existing bridges that are maintained. Um, for example, I noticed through all our Slack instance that like once a year or so, we lose the bridge for about a month because Slack changed something upstream that takes a while to get that kind of updated. Um, and I think Matrix has a bit of a better track record of the bridges that are existing and out there are better maintained. They don't quite have that kind of quality of life. Uh, it does offer end-to-end -end encryption for things. Uh, it has a variety of clients available. Uh, so it has ones that work on your phone and will annoy you with alerts just like other platforms will <laughs> if you ask for that. It has web apps, um, and then we'll get to the local 3GSD, and it has desktop apps for lots of popular platforms. Um, it has a server app, um, a server implementation of each one that we can run on 3GSD. So there is something that we can host ourselves in the cluster. And in particular, for situations where we want to have kind of more secure rooms, we can guarantee that the data that we need are up. So that we can make sure that um, for some channels that we have, for example, some teams have their own private channels, um, we can make sure that's not living on somebody's cloud somewhere, that it is only living on the cluster mach machines itself, because we can run this on our, on our OS. And it's also a solution that is popular among other open source communities like KDE and GNOME. So how would this work if we were to do this? <laughs> um, kind of the way that we are thinking about it right now is that we would, I guess um, if you're not familiar with Matrix, because I'm actually not the best expert on Matrix to be honest, um, it's a federated system. So there's kind of, uh, servers can provide a name, you can kind of have an account which is a user at a domain effectively. Um, and then all these different servers can join into a larger community. So you can have an account, not as a global account on a network like you might kind of have on IRC where you're making a global across the network. Um, but you have an account on a kind of uh, server itself that then is shared among different realms, I guess. And so we would have a previously.org kind of namespace inside of the matrix. And we would give, um, like your login ID previously at org, and it would be authenticated because it comes from us, so it's belonging to every, every committer, kind of using your LDAP credentials like we do for other things. We would have the ability to have uh, on our server to host private rooms for teams who want that. So for example, Core is a team that, that every term we have some kind of private channel somewhere, um, and then sometimes 
Not that it doesn't mean anything optimal IRC, we start to spam with bots sending the spam, which happens. Um, if we don't make it up, we wouldn't have that problem later. Um, but we also but we also would like to have public channels and have this be a place that um, is a very easy and associated with FreeBSD and org as a kind of official looking place to find public forums to talk with developers and to have focused channels on specific topics. Um, and we might offer um, an element at FreeBSD.org, which runs kind of the element web application at the front end that's native to our server. And you don't have to have that for matrix, but it may be just a convenient um, tool for people to use uh, their credentials to access uh, our matrix server. So what kind of clients are available that we are aware of that work um, with matrix? So there's several web applications that we've verified work with on FreeBSD. Uh, there's a native client uh, KD application that's a client that works on FreeBSD, as well as, I guess, one that you can work on the console, or if you really want that IRC experience. Um, Underwood, I guess, has uh, an integration for Matrix, so it could be a Matrix client, um, and that runs on FreeBSD and several other platforms. Um, and then, kind of, maybe the most popular, I think, uh, application is one called Element that comes both as a web app, as the first one, but also has kind of native desktop type apps, applications. Um, for like Windows and Mac um, and mobile devices. And we also, uh, Lee Wynn, I think, is working with someone who's currently working on a native port of that to, to run on FreeBSD as an application on FreeBSD as well. So, what have we, where have we gotten, gotten to in this process and what have we kind of done so far? Um, so, we do have kind of a development little test server set up at the moment. Um, Core is actually using this ourselves to try to see what the experience is like. We'll kind of work through. What are the clients like? What issues you're into trying to use this? Uh, we don't currently have this opened up to the public in any way. I think it would be a staged process to kind of move forward from this point. Um, and we're still working on um, a timeline of maybe what the next steps might be and how that will work. And as we develop that, we will definitely communicate that and kind of get feedback on how it's going or not going. And then I guess one other real obvious question is, what does this mean for all the other IAM platforms that we currently use as a project? Um, I think the first thing is that um, like, this is just a proposal that we're looking at and trying to tease out and see how well it works or doesn't work. We're not like, definitively saying that we have to do this. We think it's a good idea. We think this will actually be a direction we'll want to go in and we'll get us to a good place. Um, but we're, um, but we're not like, we're still in the early stages of exploring how this is going to look. And there's a lot to still figure out about how well this is going to work or not. Um, so for right now, we don't foresee this having any changes on the platforms that we use today. Um, and in particular, we realize that right now we have individuals who volunteer their time to help moderate on these platforms. And we like, that's a very valuable resource and a very valuable donation to the project that we appreciate. Um, and if we do eventually end up adopting matrix in some form, we're going to need something similar on matrix. Um, but we, we're not doing this because we think, because we don't value the, the time and effort people are putting in. Like that's a, that is a, something that we see as important to the project, and an important contribution to the project. Um, there are also the opportunity to, uh, in the future, have bridges between matrix and other networks, if that makes things smoother, especially for transition. Uh, we don't foresee right now hosting like project maintain bridges, um, in particular, kind of dealing with the resources that cluster admin has and what, how much they can manage. Um, but it's pretty easy for other folks if they want to set up a bridge between the world's <coughs> end. Um, and then, kind of to reiterate what I said at the beginning, um, we think currently that this is going to be a good solution. Uh, but we realize that we still have a long way to go to find out if that's really true or not. And so I, I think, you know, see this as a proposal. Uh, what we think will make sense and help our community going forward. Um, but we still have a lot to figure out. And so we may still figure out something that says that those are similar ones. If that's what we figure out, then that's what we figure out. Um, so we're not hard saying this is what we have to do. We think this will be something that eventually, um, if it makes sense, and if, it, if, if we end up with a solution that people like and migrate to because they think it's a better solution, we think that will be better for the project. And that's kind of our aim and what we, our vision we're trying to do. So I think that was the last thing we had. Um, we want to open the floor to any questions, and it doesn't have to be about Matrix. Um, it could be a question about anything that anybody would like to ask. 
but they won't have a, and you don't have to ask just me. In fact, I'd be happy to have someone else talk. Um, so you can ask any of us a question that you might have. I think, are you ready, Kirk? Yeah. Sure. So, I mean, I, I'm going back to the stuff about moving forward with Git tools. Okay. Um, is, have you got any structure on that yet? I mean, are, uh, so I will, what I will say before Warner <laughs> jumps out of his seat and strangles me is we have an entire working group. Um, I think is it tomorrow afternoon? Yeah. Tomorrow afternoon we have a working group that's chaired by Warner and Lee Wynn, I believe. Um, and Warner in particular is going to talk about his recent experience with kind of interfacing with pull requests on GitHub and working through the process of curating those and bringing them into the tree. And I think he's also going to talk more about the question of workflow. So I think probably the, like, when we did get, for example, the way the, the core team at the time decided to handle that was rather than the nine people of core trying to manage that process, we anointed Ed as the leader, poor sucker, um, and said, you know, go find a group of people to work with you, a small team, and go off and work on what you think the best solution for Git is, and then come back and tell us what you find. And if, you know, and you're kind of blessed to go do that, and when you come back with something that's not crazy, then you say, yes, you know, go forward and do it, and execute the thing you want. And I think the way to think about um, workflow stuff is a similar model. Um, that it's, it's something that core thinks is important and that needs to be worked on, but that we think that is something that, like for example, Warner and Leewood are in a great position to kind of go off and grab a few people that make sense and kind of work through what items are and come up with a proposal for what to do next. And then, as long as that proposal doesn't look ridiculous, and I don't expect it will, um, then sure, go for it. Go do the thing. And I think in general that model makes a lot more sense for things that we want to do. Like, it's not like in this case, there's a couple of core members in particular who are working on matrix, but it's really that you have a group who are working on this idea. It's not all nine people of core. That's not I think core's role to try to actually directly do things we think should happen, as much as kind of bless the you know you have the authority to go work on this task. You you said something or we think there's, it's either you come to us with something that we think is a good idea, just go off and work with it and tell us what you come up with it with a more refined proposal. Or it's something where we see a need and we'll go grab someone, just what happened to Ed before and sort of order now, and say, hey, don't work on this because we think this is important and we really think it'd be viable in the project. So I think that's the way to think about how that will happen and probably that session in the afternoon will be the best time to ask more questions about that. Yeah. So if I can say two, yes, you two can. things quickly. <laughs> um, I didn't really think that you were going to skateboard. <laughs> well, you know, I can only sit on my hands for so long. Um, but uh, the last Git group I tried to spin up was, hey, let's do everything. And that totally failed and I got burned out. Um, this time it's like, what things are people doing and how can we chunk the pieces in to our workflow as it makes sense? Even if we make a couple mistakes along the way, we were pretty afraid of uh, making mistakes and trying for perfection and that wasn't a good strategy. Yeah. So I'll talk more about that tomorrow afternoon, but I just thought that that was put a nice. You know, yes, yeah. I think your real progress is better than no progress. Well, sometimes we get caught up with doing no progress for sake of perfection. Right, my, my, my role is basically to provide a meeting place for the different people who are working on different aspects or when there's overlap um, and also to have some followers who might eventually become volunteers to help people out and say, um, oh, I do better work, I can help with that, or whatever. So, anyway. So is this external tool chain? That's a separate topic. External tool chain is today, yeah. after lunch. This is tomorrow, towards the end of the day. Here, in fact, what did I bring up today? Schedule. Let me bring up the schedule, because also I need to see what time we are, how far off we are on our schedule still. We're doing great. We're doing great. All right. That's what Ann tells me. Does that mean we went short? Is what you're telling me? Yeah. This is going to be quicker for you to bring that up than me to get my slow Mac to respond. Plus, it's up next. You like doing it anyway. He's got it. Yeah. All right, so what do I do? This one? Oh, but that's not going to help you. All right. I may have to do it here so it actually ends up on the. Ah. 
the uh, people on the stream don't really need to see the schedule. They can't hurt. Oh no, you did that. Okay. Fine, we'll do it this way. Um, so apologies on the stream because you can't see it. Well, they can, they can just go to the website. You can go to the website and see it. Um, so this afternoon, our first working groups that we have are um, GSOC, which is going to be headed by Joseph. I should have done this this morning. Oh, well. Again, rest. Lots of rest. We'll get the rest off. Um, and then another uh, group headed by Brooks to talk about external tool chain, which uh, if I were to summarize, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's about the idea of we really like LVM. We don't really like this as something always having to build it as part of build world. Um, and, and maybe 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 uh, our experience has been that we found that LVM is responsive enough as an upstream that we can live with the fact that it's always installed before. Is that a, a fair assessment? Yeah, we're, we're also I'm also motivated by the fact that we need to get that, that Rust could come in and we, we need to the the mm -hmm. get fleet driver cores and that and that sort of thing in Rust soon. So we need to be ready to support that. And who wants to build another copy of the yeah, LVM? So we have two of them being incorporated into the So that's not happening. Yeah. <laughs> lots, lots, of, yeah lots, lots of bad things happen. So too much electricity. Um, then we are going to have a break with cake. Um, after that, uh, one of the things we have done um, in summits recently, if you've been watching our online summits, and I have a lot more time for quarters, I think, um, is We've been kind of trying to feature um, kind of story time, or kind of what we want to call it, called previously by the fire, or kind of inspired by FDR's fireside chat or something. But it's a notion of um, just sit down and kind of have a casual conversation, looking back, you know, maybe some amusing stories in the industry. Um, and for this conference, we are going to be having a part of this conversation with Mike, who's going to be sharing some of his history. And that's this afternoon after cake. Then we'll have a break before dinner. And then tomorrow, the working groups we have. Let's see which way. Ah, I have the mouse over here. Oh, that's going too much. Um, tomorrow morning, we're going to start off. Yeah, I'm very excited. Um, kind of doing some of the planning we've done in the past. Uh, our 14 I know is about to close. So we'll kind of start off by touching on that and seeing what else we need to fix besides open SSL um, before we can kind of resume our process of getting 14 I know out the door. And then spending some time with brainstorming about what folks might want to work on and kind of what we're maybe planning to work on for 15, which is due out in two ish shirts we have this year. Um, after that, we'll have lunch, then we'll all get together and have our picture taken in one form or another. And then we have a couple of uh, more groups to, in the afternoon. Um, Ed and Joseph are going to head a group kind of more focused on the kind of technical projects that are being worked on on the foundation. And I guess have more of a discussion around that. Um, we're also going to have a group focus on documentation in the other room, hopefully, kind of by the end of it. Um, and then uh, finally, at the end of the afternoon, we're all going to sit and listen. To, well, not sit and listen. We're all going to participate in a wonderful conversation with Warner about our flows. If it's missing and listening, it'll be short. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we will not just listen. Um, with Warner, um, uh, talking about, as he just, we were just talking about with workflows, but also his experience recently with working with contributions on GitHub and the various stories of that, and I guess both pros and cons, but I've seen both of those so far, at least on IRC chat. <laughs> so, um, all right, so aside from that, where are we supposed to, when, when are we supposed to actually end? 10.30. 10.30? Yeah, five minutes. Oh, yeah, five minutes? Okay, so. Because we were short, we've got it back on schedule. So of course, we're doing our job. For a um, but then we that means we still have five minutes for questions. So if there are any other questions, and any topic goes, or you can help us with questions. And after this, we're all going to run off and hide. You can't ask questions if you want us to know. Now the house going wrong. Do you feel like you're being affected? Do you feel like it's disruptive? <laughs> <laughs> See, Joseph was a course secretary. He knows how to ask the mean questions. <laughs> I mean, every core team is different and a different combination. Um, I have been on several core teams, so I can, I guess, say with authority that every core team is different. Um, from my perspective, and I will, just, I will take off my speech for the team hat, um, I feel that we're pretty functional. 
which actually is deep like for, for above average. <laughs> um, I've been on less functional teams, but I've watched less functional teams. Sorry. Um, no fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, we do not have any core team members trying to kill each other or strangle each other this turn. It's a low bar, but we are above that bar. Um, not all core teams let that. Bar. <laughs> that that was implied. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, so we all actually get along really well. Um, I would say that there are some things where we have been a bit too slow to respond. This hypothesis that we tend are working through that, um, but on the other hand, for example, I, like I specifically really wanted us to get monthly reports back up and working this term, and we had a slow start to get that working, but actually now it is printing out every month, and Sergio is sitting on us appropriately to make sure that we're reviewing them and helping them, you know, drive that process along. So there are ways in which we have we are being productive and kind of making progress. Um, we're not universally making as much progress as I personally like, think we should do with some of that people don't need. I just had too much life this year. Um, but in general, I think it's a pretty good team. And we all get along well. Um, I really appreciate the variety of folks we have, too. Um, um, so uh, you know, two of the folks who aren't here today are pretty active in participating in our calls and so forth. And that's been really helpful to have a broad range of the folks. Does anybody else want to say something? My, my comment only is, uh, it feels like we've lost a little bit of momentum, perhaps from the, the start of our, um, our, our term, um, and I think that's not unusual. You know, when we were all newly elected, we, we had grand plans of, of making lots of progress on lots of things, um, and I think reality sets in a little bit. Um, so I think, uh, I'm hoping that this, this time in person um, will maybe help us reinvigorate and, and build some momentum back uh, again. So, so just to be clear, my question was intended to be general enough that you could say whatever you want to the next podcast. <laughs> um, so we're very concise. Maybe is that better as the way we sell this? No, that's good. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Any other comments from? Or, or anybody no. else would like to support me? <laughs> well, if not. Um, so why don't we go ahead and pause for our first break, and we'll we're we'll always on schedule, so I think we get an extra two minutes or something for our break. Um, but we'll see you then, and thank you all for coming in general to our Dev Summit. Uh, well, we'll enjoy the next few days. All right. We'll be back. We'll be back. We'll be back. We'll be back in about ten-ish minutes. I think fake. We were knocking off rust, and we're trying new things. So we'll see how this goes. Um, but no, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun, I think. Yeah. So we've asked Mark to do a session where we're kind of tentatively calling it guided coding. So we're letting Mark decide what part of the system he wants to walk through. Um, and I'll let Mark then kind of further describe how it works the structure and manage questions and so forth. So while we fight with projectors and HDMI capture devices, you need me to stall a little bit more and you're about ready. Uh, uh, John, I mean, <laughs> there you are. So I'm going to do stretching motions, so I think I get into doing the song dance. I'm not in the camera. So what about you? Now you're camera. in the camera. Now I'm in the camera? Yep. Well, I'll move over here to solve that problem. It's working before. Do you want to maybe talk a little bit about what your plan is? Sure. Tell you the structure? Yeah. Yeah. Is this a front camera? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm Mark Johnson. I'm a previous one. Uh, John approached me a couple months ago, basically asking if I would do some kind of code reading um, as part of the Dev Summit. So you know, normally we have talks, someone presents some technical topic, uh, there's a bunch of slides, and you know, that's fine, but um, we thought it would be kind of interesting to do something different and you know, sort of interactively go through a core piece of code for JP, um, you know, talk about it at whatever level people feel like they can contribute at, and uh, just with the hope that you know people come away with a bit more knowledge than they had before, um, in particular, uh, you know, in a format that's pretty loose, uh, that doesn't involve just me talking, because um, that's kind of monotonous. Um, so, what I'd like to do is talk about the FreeBSD uh, CPU scheduler. Uh, well, actually, we have two. There's one called ULE, which is the default for uh, uh, 15 years, a long time. Uh, it's longer than I've been a FreeBSD developer. Um, so, 
Uh, and my, my notion was that, you know, I just introduce a few kind of pieces of background and then just start looking at the, the code in the frequency schedule, which does context switching. So switching between the different threads. Um, and then from there, you know, depending on how things go, if people have questions or comments, uh, we can, you know, branch over to different parts of the scheduler, look at specific things, look at specific issues. Uh, people who've been following mailings probably noticed that there's been some discussion of dual performance lately in particular workloads, so we could talk about that. Um, or other topics like scheduling on heterogeneous CPU systems with you know, uh, power and energy cores. Um, so I think because there's people with varied backgrounds here, not everyone's going to take away the same thing or absorb as much. If you don't know very much about FreeBSD kernel stuff, uh, you might be a bit lost, but hopefully you'll come out of this with a bit more knowledge than you had before. If you're an expert, you can just ignore me for the next hour um, or you know, make comments as you see fit. Um, and if you're somewhere in between and have questions, like, please interrupt me at any time. And, uh, and uh, we'll, you know, like, there's, there's no particular direction or uh, time limit for anything that I'm doing. So um, please, yeah, please feel free to interrupt or offer anecdotes, examples, questions. Um, so I'm not sure if that was enough stalling. You're streaming. I'm streaming? OK, great. Um, and then I'm just taking that. To, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so I have some notes here that I'll uh, make available. Um, they're they're not really, you know, they're meant for someone who's not very familiar with with uh, ULE or Yule. Um, Why is it called Yule? Why is it called Yule? That's a great example, or a great, great question. Um, so you'll notice the clever file name here. Um, so as I said, there's two there's two schedulers in FreeBSD. For BSD, which is not enabled by default, not compiled into the kernel by default, which you know lived in sked underscore for BSD.c. And then Jeff, who wrote the, the ULE scheduler, uh, cleverly decided to call it ULE so that the file name is just scheduled. So. It doesn't stand for that. It's not an acronym. It's, not an acronym. it's just Yule or Yule. Um, so I just want to give a bit of background. So you know we're all on the same page at some level, um, and particularly to find a couple of terms that are going to come up a lot. So a CPU is just a machine that executes instructions. Instructions are just you know small computational operations that operate on registers or memory. It doesn't really matter. But the point is that a CPU just takes an instruction, executes it, takes the next instruction, executes it, and that's all it does. Even when it's doing nothing, it executes instructions. They do that. Um, so a thread can be thought of as a stream of instructions that produce some desirable output. Um, in a particular, a computer can run multiple threads, multiple streams of instructions. Um, so it's up to a subsystem in the, in the operating system called the scheduler to decide you know, where does a particular thread get executed. So it has a set of CPUs, it has a set of threads that want to do something. So the scheduler is responsible for assigning threads to CPUs and letting them do the thing. Um, so as I said, there's there's two schedulers in FreeBSD. One uses our yeah, one one's Yule and one for BSD. So I'm gonna mostly talk about Yule because I'm not particularly familiar with for BSD. But uh, if anyone has any points of comparison, that'd be interesting. Are there any questions? Like any comments so far? So far so good? All right. Um, so I want to start by looking at a particular function for DSD, which is quite central, called MI switch. Uh, so as I said, we have a scheduler which takes threads and runs them on CPUs. So at some point, uh, because you know, we, we don't want threads to run forever, given the opportunity, uh, there's a function in FreeBSD that periodically gets called to decide whether it should switch to a different thread on the current CPU. Uh, so in FreeBSD, that's called MI switch. It's not part of ULE, it's part of a kind of generic layer that services both for BSD and ULE. Um, so it's pretty short. I mean, it's kind of hard to see on this screen, but like it doesn't it doesn't do a whole lot of stuff. There's a few, there's a whole bunch of assertions. Uh, there's an XXX comment whose origin I'm not sure of. Uh, so as a quick start, we can take a quick tour through the blame history and see that it was added by Peter Worm in 2003. 
What does it mean? It's going to be a whole bunch of stuff. So at least people know that it's me, but I try to clean those up before I commit. Um, okay. It's so, sorry. It's Julian's fault. It's Julian's fault. Adding an original one. There well, are. Well, XXX is pretty Julian, but, X, but we got a whole bunch of them with XXX cases. Well, yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. This particular. Oh, is this particular one? This particular one is Julian's fault. It's Julian. Ah, I'm not surprised. Oh, okay. Sorry. Right. You have 15 XXX and Julian. <laughs> how many, how many, right. um, how many uh, what to do XXX do we still have? PSC what to do. Oh. <laughs> our, our code right. is never finished. It's always evolving. There's always yeah. imperfections. That's okay. So yeah. moving on. Um, so just looking again at the prototype, we take some set of flags. And then you know, right off the top, we have a whole bunch of assertions, which are basically just 
you know, checks that are enabled in debug kernels, which verify that you know, various pieces of state match what we expect. Um, so there's a few assertions on the flags. In particular, we assert that you know, each switch is either voluntary or involuntary. So an example of a voluntary switch is when you know, a thread decides it has nothing to do, it'll put itself to sleep. Um, so that you know, anytime you call sleep in your code, you're doing a voluntary switch. Sometimes you can just yield the CPU, um, which is the same thing. An involuntary switch occurs uh, typically because a thread you know, wants to keep executing, but the scheduler's decided that it's time for another thread to take over CPU. Uh, so at that point, the thread is forced to relinquish its, its you know, use of the CPU, and the, and the scheduler will decide what to do at that point. So my switch is the entry point to that functionality as well. Um, there's also this SW type mask, which basically lets, lets the caller run my switch to specify exactly why they're switching. So there's a few different, you know, it's not worth really getting into all of them, but there's SWTC, too, basically means the thread is, is getting ready to go to sleep. It'll get woken up at some further point and then enter back into the schedule and it'll get assigned to the CPU at some point. Um, there's a few others here, you know, in this case, the thread is switching because it was bound to a different CPU, so we're going to go through the scheduler to, to push it over. Um, but there's, I think these, these flags are not really used, they're more used for statistical purposes. So, you know, if you enable counters in your kernel, you can, you can see how many of these different types of uh, switches occur. And if you go through the callers, um, you can see that each of them kind of has a lot of different SWT. So there's the call, which kind of tells you whether it's bugged or not, and then a time which you can do with more information about what's going on. I like to use more information. So there's a whole bunch of assertions. They don't really do anything in, you know, in, in most kernels. There's a couple of checks here for exceptional cases where the kernel is panicked or it's in the debugger. So we can mostly ignore those. There's a couple of lines of code here which just do some accounting. So every time there's a voluntary switch, we increment a counter in the thread. Each time there's an involuntary switch, we count it again. So you can see that sort of thing in like uh, There's some, there's some command which shows you those numbers if you're, if you're so interested. Um, the meat of the function is, well, even here, we're, we're just doing a bunch more counting. So we grab the current time, we save it in the thread, uh, so the, the schedule has some idea of how much time is uh, really spent running on a particular CPU. Uh, so you know, if you're just incrementing a whole bunch of counters that are used by various subsystems, uh, we have a dtrace probe here, so there's a scheduler provider in dtrace, which basically lets you attach little hooks to events in the scheduler. So, for instance, you know, um, every time a thread is preempted, you can do something like you know, see which uh, what the what the process name is. So this is not too interesting because it's just a particular thread called the idle getting preempted, but you can see some other examples here, XOR. Um, and so those, those, you know, this, this on its own doesn't really tell you a whole much uh, or a whole lot, but uh, uh, you, can, you can get more specific information and collect aggregations that uh, kind of characterize what's going on in the scheduler at a, at a higher level. Um, so buried in all of this is a single function called to set switch, which redirects you either to uh, Schedule lead or schedule BSD. So, in general, both these files implement the interface uh, scan underscore something. So, get switch is the thing which actually switches. So, here we have a whole bunch of other code. Uh, again, not, you know, not a giant function. It looks a bit big on the projector, perhaps, but if you open it in normal resolution, it's not too bad. Um, so, one particular I didn't notice this percent CPU update call. Um, so one of the things I want to talk about is uh, you know, how the scheduler decides to put a particular thing on the CPU. Um, some threads intrinsically have higher priorities, so each 
each, each thread has an assigned priority, like a, a numeric priority. So I described this in the notes a little bit. Um, let's see. So there's, there's, a, there's a range of numbers from 0 to 55, which describe the scheduling priority. Um, to be actually confusing, uh, 0 is a high priority. Um, <laughs> and so those, those roughly determine you know, the order in which they are going to get executed by a particular CPU. Um, did anyone have any questions or comments? So, uh, so yeah, the, the notes kind of go into the breakdown of the different sub ranges of this. Uh, <laughs> Of this uh, priority range, but the gist of it is that you know, if the thread spends all this time executing instructions, it naturally it tends to naturally get assigned a lower priority, it's a higher numeric priority, because uh, you know we know that it's going to use all the CPU we can give it, whereas other types of threads, which might spend most of time sleeping, so we spend these between responses to network requests. Uh, you know, if you have a web server that serves some amount of traffic. It's going to get a request every so often. We have to handle it for practices. So it's kind of natural to want threads that behave that way to, to get higher uh, higher priorities and so lower lower numeric priorities. So what this function is basically doing is just keeping track of how much time the thread has the thread spent on the CPU. When so the thread goes to sleep, we also keep track of how long it spends sleeping. Uh, so the, the roughly the ratio of those two numbers informs the decision about how to prioritize a particular thread. There's other pieces of input, input um, that I'll get into, but uh, that's, that's kind of roughly how it works for, for user threads. So every time we switch, uh, some statistics in the thread get updated that are used to make scheduling decisions later on. Uh, so again, we have a whole bunch of bookkeeping, which is not particularly interesting. Um, and here we kind of look at, you know, what's what's going on. Why is like, a, like, are, are we are we switching because we're done running on the CPU? Um, well, okay, let's let's say it this way. There's three cases here. First, um, is the current thread just the thread that's switching off? Is it the idle thread, which basically is the thread that runs with nothing else that there's no other work to? Um, so that's kind of a a degenerate case. But then you have this TD is running case and else. So TD is running means that the thread is left to keep running. Um, but for some reason, you know, this guy which decided that it's going to make this moment to decide whether it's going to allow to do that. So, uh, we, we basically add it, to, uh, add it back to the, the scheduler's running case, which is the data structure that the scheduler uses to keep track of, uh, to keep track of you know, threads that are waiting to run. Um, run queues in uh, previous year are really quite simple. Um, it's just an array of, array of threads. Um, it's not super easy to see this from the, from the definition itself, but if you, uh, you can kind of imagine it like just a, a table of Just, a, just a, an array of, of queues that contain threads. So the idea is that threads with higher priority and so lower numeric priority take place somewhere near the front of the queue, and low priority threads take place near the end. Uh, when a thread, and so when Muli decides, you know, it's going to, which, which thread is going to pick, in general, when it does, it kind of looks at the first button and says, okay, are there any threads there? If so, that's the one I'm going to select. Otherwise, I'm going to go to the next queue and so on. So that's all this data structure is tracking. And the bits, they effectively serve as an optimization. So, um, like I said, there's 64 queues. Uh, I think, let me double check that. Yes, yeah, so you can see 64. Um, and so the, the bits are basically just, um, you know, you can kind of represent this. When you're searching for a thread, you basically want to see, you know, what's, what's the first queue that actually contains the thread? Because some of them might be empty. Um, so generally what we do is we have a set of bits. Uh, yeah, and 
tell you very quickly whether each queue contains at least one thread. So if thread zero or Q0 contains a thread, then it's going to be set. If this one doesn't contain anything, it's going to be zero. Uh, and so that, that's the thread that gets kind of represented there. So uh, when, when you leave those big thread, it all it has to do is scan this set, and then it takes the first one that has a hybrid set. Any other questions or comments? I guess this is a bit, a bit specific, but um, so okay, we have a thread that was running, wants to run again. What you read does, does at this point is decide, okay, can we push it onto a different CPU? You know, most modern systems have multiple CPUs. Um, it might be advantageous for various reasons to pick a different one so that any twins that are assigned to this particular CPU that are on one of its running queues. Um, uh, they, they can both run in parallel. So this get pick CPU, uh, I'll just kind of scroll through it without really explaining it because it's a fairly complicated function. Or at least it looks complicated. It's actually pretty simple. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the data structure that underpins that. Um, but basically it returns the CPU and really says, okay, is the CPU that we chose the current CPU? Then you know we just add it to the queues. Otherwise, we're going to migrate the thread to a different CPU. Uh, so when it comes to actually picking the CPU, um, the, the scheduler uses a concept of affinity uh, in the sense that you know, in a multi-CPU system, CPUs share caches of various levels. Um, so in general, this, if a thread has been running on a particular CPU and you want to keep running, it's helpful for performance if you can schedule it on a CPU that's in some sense close to the one where it was already running. So either the, the same CPU or one that's close to it. So the curl maintains a, a graph. You can dump it as an XML, uh, XML tree, I guess. Um, so in this particular lot, not the eight CPUs, and they're written into an order to, to uh, represent a zero type or hybrid frame. So you really know about the topology of the system at some level. Um, and so Knowing that the CPU is zero and one are actually you know, physically collocated. And so there's, there's probably some performance gain to be had if a thread is running on CPU zero and then runs on CPU one instead of CPU zero and then CPU you know, four, because uh, you, you'll be reusing the same caches. Uh, so, what, what that sort of complicated pick CPU function does is uh, effectively just search through that hierarchy. So in a more, in a, you know, on a, on a server class system, you might have several layers of hierarchies depending on whether the cores share the last layer or the last level cache, depending on whether they belong to the same NUMA domain. Uh, there, there's a, a few different considerations that, you know, uh, uh, determine whether two CPUs are sort of close to each other. Um, an interesting note is that, like, on big little systems, so systems where you have CPUs with different performance profiles, are fairly new thing, at least as far as kind of consumer hardware goes. I have access to one, so I'll show you, but uh, I have to SSH through a couple of different things first. This is a Microsoft Dev Kit. <coughs> um, so you can see that if you look at the blue line messages, that's the two types of CPUs, Cortex HMBAC and Cortex Frequency. Um, the idea is that you know, the first world orders are, are supposed to be more energy efficient, um, whereas uh, the uh, second world orders you use uh, are, are faster to consume more power. So you expel that in, you know, in different workloads. Um, like you, you, you want to take the, the, the difference between these two classes of CPUs into account when making schedule of decision. A record is consuming as much CPU time as possible. All these schedules are one of these words, whereas a friend which, you know, goes to sleep very frequently, uh, might make more sense to schedule on the energy of the words. And so what's interesting to note is if you dump the topology that you really sees, it doesn't know the graph. It just puts them all on the same big uh, group. So anyone who's interested in this kind of stuff, you know, I'd be happy to talk about it after, but. The very first step towards improving our schedule on these kinds of systems is to you know, make, make people really aware of the topology that underlies uh, uh, you know, the physical system. Because, as you 
CLC right now, it doesn't, it doesn't know anything about that. You can use a program called CPU set to manually find threads that particular CPUs, but that's not really what we want to have to do.
most of the time you can get away with empty single unit drives. So we use spin new taxes specifically synchronized between hardware interrupts and, and high threads. Um, so which is which is where this spin lock enter kind of comes into play. So the thread lock is a special type of spin lock, um, which I'll get into time permitting. Um, but uh, the, yeah, so it's it's not a mutex. It's it's kind of this particular call is better bookkeeping. In general, what it does is disable interrupts. So anytime you see that, you know you're in some very low level code. Um, that's that's doing something that synchronizes with, with interrupts in some some way. But uh, so at this point, we already hold the lock. We, we already hold the lock for the current thread, and we're we're kind of doing some clever tricks here so that um, the thread which currently holds the lock and is about to go off the CPU kind of transfers its lock to the thread which comes back onto the CPU. Uh, so so back to the Pick CPU. Um, so you only pick the target CPU for the for the current or for the current thread, depending on you know the history of its execution. So it tries to schedule on local on nearby cores, and depending on how busy those cores already are. So you know if if the current core has a lot of other threads waiting for work or, or waiting to be run, uh, we we will pick a different one. If all the local CPU, if all the sort of CPU in the neighborhood are, are very loaded. So we'll kind of go further and further in the, in the graph to find a target CPU. Um, so at this point, we add it to the run cubes. So that's the exact structure that I was talking about earlier. That's just the side cubes. There's a, each CPU has three, three run cubes um, that are organized in this data structure called uh, the TD cube. So this is a UOE specific thing. There's one per, there's one per CPU. So in UOE, each CPU has its own set of uh, Threads that have been assigned to it, and then and my switch is called. All it really does is look the CPU looks at its current queues, picks the, the highest priority one, and runs it. That's really all it does. Um, so you can see here there's three of these run queues, which again correspond to. Uh, so each each run queue has 64 queues, which seems like a lot, and like, it kind of is, but that's how it is. And then you think about it, that, like you know your, your average running system hopefully doesn't have more than Maybe two or three threads assigned to a CPU at a given point in time. That's that's a pretty, you know, maybe it doesn't make sense to generalize too much. I, I, it's, it's, it's a bit more but uh, it's not one, right? It's the real to have one mobile run cube. I see. Yes. It's, it's, it's a, that's why you divide by four to get from two to be six thousand to six to one cube to get four. Right. Then um, when I added very simple simple first CPU Thank you. 
So this is, we're dealing with the current thread which is coming off the CPU. Um, if the current thread which is coming off the CPU doesn't want to run anymore, um, then we effectively, uh, yeah, it says there's a comment, the thread must be going to sleep. Uh, we remove it from, uh, from the run queues. Um, there's a bit here which tries to do some work stealing, but I won't repeat that. Um, there's, uh, there's a couple of KDR statements. KDR is used to trace uh, things of state from the kernel. Um, and maybe with the remaining time, rather than kind of going through nitty gritty stuff, I'll show you um, a, bit of, a few examples of how you can sort of visualize decisions that are made by the scheduler. Um, so there's a couple of tools. Um, one is in the tree, it's kind of old. I don't know if you can see it very well. Yeah, the screen is that's okay. So there's there's a couple of sliders that you can use to kind of yeah, they basically you zoom in on different parts of the, the timeline. But the the gist of it is that you know those those keep your um, uh, those keep your statements that we saw in the code are basically used as input for. Um, for this, uh, for this display. So you can kind of see on that. So there's, there's you know, a row for every single thread in the system, uh, and the color kind of tells you what it's doing at any given point in time, um, whether it's actually executing on the CPU or um, uh, waiting on 
uh, run queue or sleeping or whatever it happens to be. If you hover over, um, if you hover over uh, maybe the bar, the little display at the bottom will, uh, will kind of tell you um, if there's coming on a CPU. So that's that's well, that's what these KPR statements are used for. Um, the same information can also be gleaned from uh, any trace codes. So if you go into um, in the source repository, if you go into tools sketch, um, there's there's a few tricks in here which uh, might be worth taking a look at. So skipgraph.d is a dscript or a dtrace script, um, and it kind of tells you how to use it and create that, that visualization. So that can be really useful for nailing in on that, um, you know, sort of fine-grained behavior of the skip. It collects a lot of data, um, but it's it's really 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 useful for debugging. Um, another tool which is not yet in the tree, but I'm planning to work on it during this conference is um, KuTrace, which is uh, a tracing framework. Created by uh, big sites to a company, uh, well, not for, but it, it accompanies a textbook that you were on the people performance. And it broadly does, um, it, it gives you similar looking traces. Um, I'm going to see if I can zoom in on something particular here. So you can see it's kind of a similar visualization you get. Um, you get a, you know, all the threads that we're running, and you get some kind of bar graph, or you get a bar that sort of tells you a little bit about its execution history. And I'm trying to look for a particular thread that I traced uh, earlier, but I had it all set up, and then I have to resize my monitor, and I think it's lost. If you zoom in a lot, oh, there we go. Yeah, or any Python. So, Zoom, 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 zoom. Uh, so I don't know if you can see it on the bottom. Yeah, that's good. Oh, Sorry about that. Yeah. Zoom, 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 zoom. Yeah. And so the, the scale at the bottom of the time scale that's obviously you know, pretty short. What I was doing is, um, I was running MD5 sum on my on my on my SSD. Yeah, now you can see. So I was basically competing to check some of one of my MD partitions. Because that's a that's a that's an interesting workload from a schedule perspective. You know, Fred is you know reading on SSD on the disk. You know, that has to be pretty pretty weird. And it competes part of the check sum, but whatever that is returned, and it asks for that as the Some more, you can get really finely, finely grained visualization. Um, so, this is, so you can, there's, there's a few different uh, pieces of information you can kind of get. But it'll even tell you the system call that it was in. Um, it was waiting in a run queue for a little bit. You know, it exited the read system call, very much of stuff in user space. This would be competing to check some. And call read again. And if you kind of scroll forward, you'll see it once you're done. You'll come out. And here's the next window. Um, so that's that's not quite yet available, but I, I hope it will be uh, fairly soon. Um, so that's KU trace. Um, it's it effectively consists of a set of patches to put ESD and then a standalone kernel module. And then uh, a set of user space tools, um, which let you extract tracing information from the kernel. Um, so it's a bit, it, it has very low code when it's enabled, relative to, say, DTrace or, or KTR, which are quite expensive to enable. Uh, so it has that going for it. It's, it's 
correspondingly limited in the amount of information it can collect. So everything is kind of hard coded in the sense that it will grab a few pieces of information like the, the name of the thread and, and so on, like which system call it was in, but it doesn't give you the, the, seat, the, the scheduling priority, which is something that's uh, um, you know, something you might want to see. So it's, it's just another another tool that will that'll be helpful for analyzing the, the sort of low level decisions of the, the schedulers making. Um, did anyone have any questions? No. So we're back in step switch. Uh, so now it's time for the scheduler to choose a thread. Uh, and this aptly named functions choose thread. Which should call skip choose. And it calls that function I was looking at before, um, where it chooses, chooses between one of the three line keys uh, in that order. Um, so it might be worth at this point looking at the priority ranges in a bit more detail. Because uh, I wrote them out. And uh, so again, there's, there's 256 priorities. That, or, you know, that zero is given the highest scheduling priority, and, and so on. Uh, so the, the very top of the priority range. 0 to 15 is given to intra threads. So those are the threads that you know, transfer, uh, handle receive packets, they, they handle you know, timer events. Um, so things that are pretty important for keeping the uh, system operational and responsive. So those get the highest scheduling priority. Those always come from the TD, the, the real time key. Um, historically, uh, an intra thread would just run as long as it needed to. Um, recently, John added some, some code to ability to do time sharing on all high threads. So if you have a lot of high threads running, uh, because your system is, you know, under a DOS attack or something like that, uh, it's just receiving huge amounts of, of traffic. Um, the kernel, or you will try to do some some balancing of, uh, uh, of different different IP to make sure that one that they don't get started. And then there's a, there's another class of threads called software interrupt threads, which are mostly used for for packet processing. They're not actually used all that much in previous two. Um, so there's, there's a POSIX interface that lets you request real-time scheduling of user threads. So you can use this program or keep writing for the group. Uh, and we can see so you will put uh, threads that are doing real-time priority in this, in this area. So that's pretty static. On most systems, that isn't really used, but, uh, well, I don't know if we should say that, but it's kind of a special band. Um, and then we have another set of real-time priorities on uh, that that is used for kind of all the other threats in the kernel. Um, so, uh, what's an example of a kernel thread? Task queues, which, you know, basically, I don't know if there's a really good intuitive example of one, but there's a whole bunch of threads that. Uh, like ZFS has like eight for Yeah, I was, I was thinking of ZFS does a lot of asynchronous work, and it has a lot of threads which only run in the kernel. Um, so, those, those types of threads, they're not quite as important as the battle thread. Uh, and you get a very high scale of priority you get in the real time queue. Um, I also wanted to show it's, it's useful to just look at top bit output. No. So there's, there's a priority column. The 88 we'll, we'll get back to in the, in the breakdown of the, of the range of but you can see a lot of running the priority 88. If I do something I start an infinite loop in my shell. You can see it's yeah, but it's kind of garbled enough to rely. Oh, well, because the 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 string is a bit off. Maybe it's more defined, but you can see that the, the priority of the the uh, infinite loop is slowly decaying. Um, and so it, it kind of shows you that like, you know, the more CPU time a thread consumes, the, the lower it's scheduling priority. So you can kind of see if you can in the So it goes all the way to 2 or 2, and I think it'll stop at 2 or 3 if I write one for a while. At this point, it will stop. Um, priority is about to appear to be for nice threads. So there's a standard Unix tool called mice, which basically tells the system, well, uh, I really don't care about this thread. Don't schedule with any particular priority. Um, so, yeah, it's still like two or three, so I think, I think that's 
That's right. Um, so, time sharing is mostly a user device. So, you know, there's this several, several hundred views on it, and I think most of the time they're not landing. Uh, but when they do, they get, they get put in this game for the most part. And time sharing device have a property that uh, they, a low priority type of thing, but it always eventually gets some time to execute it. So even if there's high priority time to that are always ready to run on the CPU, um, if, if a low priority time to that even the right people will eventually get to run. So that's, that's a sort of starvation avoidance guarantee that you really try to make. Um, so if you have a bunch of CPU hogs on your system, if you're running a gold kernel or something like that, um, even if even if those guys are shooting through all your TPU, uh, the, the schedule will occasionally try to run other lower priority threads. And uh, how are we doing for time? I don't have much time left, but uh, are, are, are there any yeah, five minutes? Does anyone have any questions or anything in particular they'd like to see? Otherwise, I'll just kind of keep going into the, the, the schedule again. So there's this one particular range here, which is the so called interactive range. Um, the only has a heuristic where it tries to figure out whether a given grid is interactive in the sense that, you know, there's someone behind the screen that's communicating with the program. Um, it's not only used for that in practice, but that's, that's kind of the, the mental model you might have. Um, so a thread or a thread based interactive user probably spends most of its time sleeping. If you think about it, like a shell is a good example of an interactive program. It waits for you to type the command, you can enter it, you know, it does a bunch of stuff and it comes back to you. And humans are typically a lot slower than shells, so the shell statistically spends most of its time um, sleeping. So, let's see. So, you notice that if I, if I show that this fish shell in top, it's got a memory D, which is the highest interactive cost, or it's the highest interactive uh, priority. That's because it's doing nothing, it's just sleeping. So, if I start just kind of Giving it stuff to do. Uh, sorry, but it's actually showing it on the wrong line. <laughs> yeah. 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 So you can see it's it's jumping up right away, even though I'm just hitting enter. And if if I do nothing, it's actually going to stay there because it's just sleeping. The scan was on for just expired. But if I let it sleep for a while and then I just hit space, for instance, it goes back down to the data. It's not for a while. The scan is decided, oh, this is you know, this is a thread which needs to run pretty quickly. Um, so I'm going to bring it down to a lower for, for a higher priority, lower and higher priority. the time at which the thread went to sleep. And then if you look at skip wake up, which is the function which is called every time the thread is woken up, uh, you go back and you see what time it went to sleep. You set that time. You can see there's a function here which calls skip track update, which basically uses the, the time difference to decide whether you know that sleep gives it a boost in priority. Um, so there's there's a kind of numeric Fairly hard to explain function, perhaps. Um, there's a bunch of math that happens which computes the priority. And basically, the inputs are you know, how much time the input has been writing versus how much time it's been sleeping over the past you know, x seconds. I think it's basically 10 seconds of history that you really consider. So there's a few, there's a few things like that which, uh, which can be used to get special priority to. So, of course, this algorithm is perfect sometimes in traffic, but they're not scheduled as such. 
Um, if you think about something like a browser that's got quite a few, you know, dozen or hundred threads, uh, some of them will get scheduled as real time threads, but some of them will get considered as real time threads, so why not? And you know, it. Um, you know, it's one of those things that if you heard anything that stuff often works, but it definitely doesn't work all the time. Um, so, you know, you can, you can kind of test whether this is working for you if you do something like watch YouTube videos while you're building you know, the kernel in the background. Um, ideally, the, the, the video wouldn't stutter. That's an interactive thing. Most of the time, the browser is just writing um, samples to, to an audio buffer and calling into, uh, uh, calling into a graphics driver to update the screen. So hopefully, it'll, it'll get priority over, uh, over a, a build job. But in practice, and so in practice, I would say this works pretty well for me. It doesn't work well for everybody. Um, and that's, that's there's there's definitely some, some room for improvement there. But the gist of it is that any thread that's just deemed, deemed and dragged in, in particular goes into this range um, actually gets put into real, real time view and not into the time shared view. So it always gets priority over other time shared threads. Uh, so I think I'm about out of time, and it's lunchtime. Um, can I, are there any questions at all, or like is anybody? It, well, I'll, I'll say that if anyone's interested in any particular scheduler related topic, please come talk to me after uh, sometime in the next couple of days. I'm, I'm happy to chat about it. I'm not really an expert, but I know the code pretty well, and I can probably point people in the right direction if they want to learn a bit more. Um, and in general, if you found this kind of format at all interesting or useful, please let me know. If you, if you didn't find it useful, that would also be interested in doing that, or maybe just tell the Dev Summit folks to not let me do this again. But uh, <laughs> Um, so I, I, yeah, I didn't quite get through everything, but um, I'll, I'll put these notes on in my public directory as well uh, if, if folks are interested. Um, and yeah, I guess that's about it. Thank you. Mark. So it is time for lunch. Okay. Um, it looks like lunch is in the back over here. So. Uh, looks like the beverages and cups for water and stuff. To make. Um, uh, okay. I'm, I'm swapping cables. Is this your adapter or mine? I can't remember. Yours. Do you want to try a different adapter? Oh no, this one, uh, yeah, this one says it's not connected at all now. Oh no, wait, it says, no, yeah, it says disconnected. Yeah, so maybe I better go back to the other one because maybe I'll try rebooting one more time. Because I know this, this one does work usually. Okay. Okay, so I'll try rebooting. Yeah, now it'll pop up again when I when I shut down, probably. Oh yeah, not this time. Apologies. So I did actually check this earlier, but I just checked directly plugging into the to the screen here. Yep. 
there it is. That will, the key will be if it stays. Okay, so now it loads X, so that's fine. Oops. Yeah, so now my, my window manager is loaded, but. Um, all right, maybe. No, I don't need any slides, I don't think. It's okay. So, um, <clears throat> so let me just some load some things up so I can see them first, and then we'll just get started. So I think there's kind of three pretty quick points that I would like to make about, about GSOC. So I know in the past there's been some maybe questions, maybe not necessarily in FreeBSD, but in other projects, you know, whether or not the um, effort to reward for, for Google Summer of Code was worth it. And I can say in the last few years, I think it's pretty objectively clear that that Google Summer of Code is is benefiting the project. I think um, uh, if we look at just last year, or look at people in the room here, I know Jake's a participant in Google Summer of Code and Jake's uh, continued to be active. Um, he's interning with the foundation, working on some Capscom projects. Uh, Chris Doss is working with Mark on Dtrace stuff, so he's still active in the project. Enway, I don't know if Enway's still in the room, is giving a talk here at BSD Can about wireless work. So Enway was a former GSOC student. Um, were you a GSOC student? Yeah, you're on core now, right? So we have a core team member here that was a former GSOC student. Um, anybody else have any examples that I'm missing of, of former GSOC students in the last little while? So that that's that's point number one that I'd like to make. Um, that it's you know it's worth it. Um, <clears throat> And I say this as somebody that's administered the project or for one year. Um, it's a little bit of effort, but I'm happy to do it. Uh, certainly worthwhile. And men well, I guess point number two is we have certain bottlenecks, some constraints. And the first constraint is finding mentors. Um, uh, I feel horrible about pestering people on, on the developers list, but um, it's the same people that are volunteering year after year. So we get the Warner, the John Baldwin, the Mark Johnson. Um, so we really, I, I implore you, if you think you have the time, please, and, you're, and you feel that you're, you don't even have to be an expert in the field, but something that you have enough experience with, you're, you're, you're a committer, so you know kind of the processes about you know, working with the community, please consider, um, um, volunteering to mentor if you can. I understand it's volunteer and we all have limited time, but um, please try uh, if you can. Uh, the third and final point that I'd like to make is the other bottleneck is project ideas. And that's where I think, or I hope that we can make some headway today in that we can brainstorm some project ideas. I was hoping to, maybe if somebody is willing to, to share a laptop, we can uh, bring up the old ideas page. It's getting kind of uh, kind of light on ideas, so maybe today we can at least get a few new ones in there or at least get down the ideas and I can kind of talk to people and see if we can hammer out something appropriate for a Google Summer of Code uh, project. Um, and maybe I can tell you a little bit. So we were accepted again uh, this year. Um, we're kind of unique for Google Summer of Code and that we've participated every year since the beginning. And I'm trying to remember, I think it's 18 or 19 years now. Um, we have seven projects this year. Uh, one that's dealing with free networks on FreeBSD, calling the Batman free networks on FreeBSD. And uh, Mehdi Mokhtari is mentoring. Um, Mark Johnson's working with a PhD student, uh, Bojan Novicik 
on physical memory anti-fragmentation mechanisms. Uh, Chuck, who I think here is here, Chuck? Yeah, Chuck is a uh, volunteer to uh, work uh, with a student, Rag Raghav Sharma, on porting uh, squash fuse to uh, the FreeBSD kernel. So fuse, see if I can remember fuse, it's, um, it's like a compressed read-only file system, I think. Is that right, Chuck? It's, it's useful for like, like some distributions use it on their install media. Um, Ed and Li Wen are uh, working with Sheng Yi Hong on LLDB kernel module improvements. Uh, Yura, Luther, and I are working with Subin Ro on integrating MF, MFSBSD into the re release building tools. Warner is volunteering again as a mentor uh, with a student who'll work on uh, CI stuff for the bootloader. And uh, I think these, uh, no, I think Mark's is a new project and uh, the, the uh, free network ones was a new project. Uh, and then Alexander Chernikov and Gleb Smirnov, uh, I think Alexander uh, submitted a new project idea for lockless synchronization between nodes and NetGraph. Um, other than that, the other ones are, are kind of recycled ideas that didn't get picked up in past years. Um, <clears throat> so other than that, I'm hoping maybe we can brainstorm some ideas. I don't know what that is. I know this is going to be a little difficult when you can't see it, but does anybody have any anything that they have been kind of thinking about for a potential GSOC project or kind of new new kind of people to FreeBSD appropriate ideas? So this might be a short session. <laughs> I'm not sure it's going to come within free BSD only, but try to like uh, go about and uh, go beyond free BSD. Just so we can, uh, I think, also find people who are interested in other stuff uh, rather than like in charge to do free BSD. Uh, maybe it's not just like internal free BSD stuff or something like that. So introduce, introduce them sort of to the project. It's kind of like tangential to FreeBSD so that we can kind of bring them in. So for people on the uh, stream, um, Pavel, right, suggested that we kind of expand our notion of a project a little bit beyond FreeBSD so that we can expose people to FreeBSD. Um, yes, Warner. I love that idea. This year I am um, running two BSD user upstream, but I'm just running out of uh, doing a new project. And I got a lot of very good, very enthusiastic candidates. In fact, one more than we could use. Um, I couldn't find a, a mentor and a slot and a, and a way to use him. And I still need to figure out a way to sell him that. It's a man, it's a resource problem on our end, not anything you've done wrong. Um, but uh, you know, the enthusiasm and the um, confidence level, or not really confidence level, but just the um, skill skill level is much higher um, with those students than a lot of the students that I've evaluated for our project. So I think the more of these things that we can find that somehow cross fertilize, you know. A silly example would be, you know, making GIMP work on FreeBSD when it already does, but you know, something that takes an existing project and makes it work on FreeBSD, makes it work better, or integrates it into our 
CI process or our release process or something so that it, it makes it better. Or even um, like there's a lot of there's like two dozen different graphics libraries or you know Mesa and things like that. Some of which have previous CIs and some of which don't. So having an idea of where we can get more previous CIs into these embedded in these other projects might also um, be a good way to spread previous CIs, but also get some uh, additional candidates um, and you know uh, leverage the summer of code project to be more than just something that somebody does. My students last year's summer of code program. Uh, I haven't integrated into the tree yet uh, for command line editing in um, the boot world, okay. which everybody wants, everybody will love. And every time I go to integrate it, uh, fire breaks out at work. So I haven't had a chance to, to deal with that. But, um, those sorts of things I think would be very useful for the project. And also let the mentors in the project see how other projects are doing things. And that's also quite useful. So, so is that, that getting picked, picked up, up by the live stream, or should I try to, or maybe I should have given. Yeah, so I'll try to summarize. So Warner, Warner's a mentor, I should have given you the microphone, but Warner's a mentor for different uh, projects, uh, QEMU, QEMU and FreeBSD, and there are some advantages to kind of that cross-pollination or, or that, 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 working with multiple projects. Um, he mentioned that there's a bottleneck in that there aren't enough uh, people like to integrate some of his past work. Um, anything else, Warner, that I should summarize? Or should I just give you the microphone? Um, just mentors, lack of mentors. Lack of mentors is a key point. Yeah. There's a question in the here. Okay, so I'll just hand I, this around. Right. Gotcha. So actually, while you were saying that, Warner also made the point that it's good to work with other projects because we introduce people, we learn how other projects do things. Um, and you mentioned like kind of a, a an example that you know GIMP works on FreeBSD, but getting GIMP to work might be something that would be something that we should continue uh, consider. And it made me think today when Core was talking, they were talking about some. Uh, matrix client, like the element thing, like something like that, getting element to work on FreeBSD because we need it for matrix. So, so yeah, maybe we need to broaden our scope of projects a little bit. Um, and yeah, yeah. So on a similar note, uh, so also, I think that uh, uh, this is uh, coming back to uh, to what FreeBSD Foundation is doing, uh, trying to reach conferences that are not really FreeBSD specific, but like open source conferences, which I think is a great idea. But I think that what project is missing as well to like uh, extend our exposure and reach is we don't really have a lot or any uh, projects that are uh, basically generally useful, not only on FreeBSD. Like for example, OpenBSD have uh, OpenSSH, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, it would be nice to have like projects or work on projects that are currently working only on FreeBSD and try to make them work on Linux or anything else. Uh, and uh, also, I think that uh, it would be nice to uh, to invest more in like cloud related projects because I think that especially young people they want to work on uh, not on some old technology, but uh, uh, yeah, it would be nice to like find where we can fit FreeBSD, where we can merge FreeBSD with something new, with some trending technologies. Yeah. This is where what young people are actually looking for. Yeah, yeah. Sorry for not being very specific, but. No, no, that's, that's, that's good. I think that's a reasonable point. Like, it might not necessarily, it might be more projects that are beneficial beyond FreeBSD that can give us some exposure. 
What's that? Jails for Mac OS. One more time? Jails for Mac OS. Jails for Mac OS, yeah. <laughs> that might be beyond uh we might have to divide that one up for a for a GSOC project. Yes. Did somebody have their hand up? Oh, did you? oh okay. Yeah, I don't know why the ceiling is blinking and buzzing. <laughs> yeah, Jake. Oh, and Colin. Go ahead, Jake. Um, could I take the mic? Oh, yes, yes. Um, Tobias Berner keeps talking about how there's a lot of um, system D discrepancies that we're facing. So maybe extending like Linux KPI or creating a new shim for system D specifically. Yeah, to, or is that too complicated? No, no, I don't think to, Tobias. I'm, he mentions those in the graphics meetings. He says they're, you know, might be written by you know an experienced uh, developer in in a week or something. So that might be an appropriate project. So apparently, I don't run like KDE or GNOME, but apparently there's these little daemons that um, we're missing that are are useful. So those are those are great ideas. I actually might write that one down just to remind myself later. Um, Now the screen's working. And then I. If only we had somebody here that was good with computers. OK, and I think Colin had a point. Uh, this is actually a, a sp specific project, but I, I oh. could uh, mentor a student to work on uh, speeding up the FreeBSD boot process. I've done a lot of work on that, but there's there's a lot of work that can be done just taking a few systems, profiling them, and then going through, clicking through the flame charts and seeing where's, where's the time going, track down uh, the exact parts of the kernel, and uh, e either, either fix them or, or poke the right people to fix them. Okay, we have it on the recording session. Colin said he's willing to mentor for, for next year. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's something everybody likes to have their system booting faster, so great. Um, one thing that I probably should mention too, uh, this happened last year. Um, Google changed the requirements for Google Summer of Code so you don't have to be a student anymore. So they, they clarified this year, you can be a student and you automatically qualify. Like, that's full stop. Student, you cannot be a student, and as long as you're new to open source, you also qualify. Any other thoughts, comments? Anybody, anybody inspired by Colin's volunteer to mentor to, uh, <laughs> to, uh, so maybe Warner, this might be a good chance to uh, say something about mentoring. So, so Deb suggested it might be useful to have somebody talk a bit about mentoring. Um, mentor the mentor. For this, I'll use the mic. Um, so I've done several projects, some of which have been successful, some of which have been abject failures. Um, talk to your students often. Um, the more you talk to them, talk to them every week, a couple of times a week, chit chat with them online, hey, how's it going today? The more connection you can make, the more connection you can keep without it getting creepy and stocky, um, the better chance you'll have, that student will have for success. The more feedback you can give them earlier, the better. Preparing them for the FreeBSD review process is also useful because I had one student kind of flake on me when he started getting FreeBSD reviews and they were kind of all over the place, everything from, oh yeah, this is, this is good, um, to all these style nits and um, other things like that. So the more, you know, it's, it's supposed to get the student used to our culture and environment and the more that you can, you know, train on the culture and environment, the, the better off your student will have to be successful. Um, and I guess that's all I have. So. I'm not sure what Google expects. 
but um, I need to spend an hour or two at least each week um, to check up on my student, talk to my student, let my student brag about the stuff that they got done the past week um, uh, to make the projects more successful. Some projects require quite a bit more time than that, um, but uh, usually a lot of that time is upfront time. I spent, well, I had four students interested this year, five students interested this year, and I spent probably 40 hours over the past two months um, talking to them, creating uh, little tasks for them to, to, you know, are you, you, you talk a good talk, but can you do the programming? do the simple little thing with what um, QEMU does. So I, I created those and wrote up a, a, a document. So you want to run BSD user, but you're a Linux user. Well, install this environment, pull this branch, run it this way, you know, a step-by-step -step set of instructions for getting involved. Now I know BSD users, this weird quirky thing um, that uh, not everybody wants, but I think it's illustrative that if you have something you want other people to work on, you need to make it easier to get into. Um, and as soon as I did that, I got um, interest from a couple other students. They weren't anywhere near as good and they just kind of flaked and disappeared. But I, I had four really good students that I was talking to and three of them were related to um, a BSD user. And one I couldn't find a mentor for, um, so we had to p pass on him. So, anyway, yeah. That's is it. there any are there any other questions while I'm here, or? I think it's you. You said some key points that Google stresses. Uh, start communicating early and communicating often. Um, so, Jake, last year, we had some little hiccups with your in, initially, but it's a it's really good that we started early because we were able to get around those things and have a successful project. So. Um, th that just was a good example of the starting early was really important, I think, key for your success. Um, so when Cora was talking about uh, communication methods, they said there's going to be the one person that's going to continue to use IRC no matter what. I think I'm that person, but I... I, I um, I'll keep you company. <laughs> but I, I followed Google's recommendations where they suggest like video chats, like on a fairly regular basis. And I, I think those were helpful for us. Um, I mean, video is not some sort of panacea. Yeah. I do have one more piece of advice. And that's um, to, uh, I haven't done this in the past, I'm planning to this summer, is to make your student curate their work as they go along so that it's a series of commits um, that we can put into the tree because in past years, it's been one big code dump at the end. Yeah. And that is contributed to why it took, what, five or seven years to get Lua in to the tree um, for uh, the bootloader and why it's you know, going to take two years to get the command line editing into the tree yeah. um, is because it is one big blob. Um, so that's, that's, I think, the other suggestion I have, but that's not as tried and true as the other stuff I was talking about. So that's, that's, that's more than just a suggestion. So Google gives an awful lot of flex flexibility. So maybe to, to kind of touch on a point that you make, Pavel, um, Google leaves a lot of the decision making up to the mentors and the, the mentees, mostly the mentor. Like you can communicate the way you want, you can do a lot of things the way you want, but one thing they insist on is that the development happens in the open and they want you to commit often. So yeah, that's one thing we kind of uh, try to... Um, try right, to there's, there's committing often and then there's committable changes. Yeah. Because one of the, one of the things that uh, was hard for my student last summer to understand and I started way too late was there were a lot of oops, okay, to check, you know, the, the one or two word um, commits, some of which were fix a typo and some of which were implement this huge feature um, and fix five or six other things while I'm at it. Mm. And um, having that all be jumbled together is difficult. Um, in prior years, it's all been one snapshot at the end, which is even harder mm -hmm. to deal with. So 
and even harder to, to track. Um, the good thing that my student did is they did weekly snapshots. It's just it didn't dawn on me until it was way too late that I got to commit this. Mm -hmm. I got to push this into the tree. Mm -hmm. And now I've got six or 700 lines of code that I need to um, push in. And since I started looking at it, there were a number of mistakes or things that weren't as clean as they could be or that I could have had my student do if I had noticed them during the summer, but yeah. I noticed them when I went to do it, and now it's on me or on somebody else that wants to volunteer to do this. Yeah. So. so this this maybe leads to a, a more general question. You, you touched on a little bit. So you said prior to, to prepare for this Google Summer of Code summer, you put in about 40 hours over two months, but that's over three separate projects, right? That's... Two, yeah, that's that's two open source projects, two main ideas. Um, one of the main ideas is the one that I'm doing for FreeBSD, mm -hmm. and that student contacted me really early. Yeah, and two weeks later sent me the shell script that I'd written transliterated into Lua, um, and said, "I think I know Lua well enough to do this. How does this look?" And I said, "This looks great," <laughs> and then we were able to iterate from there. Cool. And that kind of built um, confidence that this student would succeed. Yeah. There were three other students from QEMU. And there, there was a, another one in FreeBSD that wasn't above the line. But there were three other students that were above the line or close to above the line. And I you know, said, thanks for being interested in the project. Here's the first level that you need to know. And then they would ask a bunch of questions. And as one would ask questions, I would update my thing of what you need to know. And then the others would benefit from that. And so it went round and round, making that better. Right. Um, but that was over you know, several, several students who had several uh, questions about a project that had kind of a high context, if you're familiar with that term, kind of a high context you needed to know in order to st even start. Because, you know, hey, I'm emulating system calls in user land. Well, you know, that's quite a bit of things you need to know, you know um, and that are implicit. Uh, you know, well, there's signal handlers and trap frames and stack frames and all this other stuff that um, I had to help my students understand so they would understand what they were doing, even though they were mostly just transporting code from one repo to another. Yeah. They needed to be able to test it. They needed to be able to you know, make sure that the, it was good. They needed to understand things. If it went right, they didn't need to understand. But if it went wrong, well, what, what's going wrong? Why is this different? Mm. And, and, and I had to help them through that learning curve. And that's, that's what took a lot of the time. I see. So what but at the end, I had three students that were very eager to do the job and um, you know, could, only do, could only select two of them. Yeah. So I mean, I guess my question was more at trying to give people an idea of, assuming you were mentoring one project, I know there's a lot of variation. Some projects right. will take more time, some projects will take less. You've, you're somebody that's mentored a whole lot. What do you think like kind of the average commitment maybe per week or something uh, for Google Summer of Code is? Right, right. Well, in the before times, it's probably three or four hours a week per student that um, is, uh, you know, enthusiastic um, for maybe three or four weeks um, initially. And then the first couple of weeks, it's a couple of hours. And then after that, it's about an hour a week mm -hmm. um, uh, on time. Um, it's not a huge commitment unless you're overloaded. And then it's like, gee, one more thing. Forget about this. Yeah. So um, it's also something that, uh, um, like you said, we, we, we grow new committers this way. Yeah, so we were, there was a board meeting yesterday, foundation board meeting, and uh, Robert made a really interesting statement. Kat actually, Kat Allman is also a board member, piped up and said, we should write that one down. Um, how, how did Robert say it? He said, like, I make these like great changes to the kernel, but I, I certainly would say that it's more rewarding or beneficial when I do mentoring because that has the potential for multiple uh, changes that are as impactful. Something, is that, did I capture it there, Dick? Yeah, something along those lines, right? Yeah, the, the, the multiplier is, is higher for mentoring. Yeah. Because I'm going to get for the couple of hours of, I'll probably put 40 hours of work in, and I'll probably, it would have taken me 
probably 120 or 160 hours to do the work that the student is going to do this yeah. summer. And that student might mentor a couple people or, you know, right. I mean, that, I'm stating, I'm playing captain obvious here. Um, you know, you get more people into the project, you get more work, but I think uh, hearing it from Robert was uh, The useful. other thing is, in some ways, I think we should be continually mentoring um, contributors, um, you know, beyond Summer of Code. You know, people that are submitting changes. Oh, one of the things I'll get into in my talk is I think we need to have a faster feedback loop for um, changes that are submitted to make people that are enthusiastic stay enthusiastic, mm -hmm. um, to get people interested. And it's from those people that you want to have a good Summer of Code relationship yeah. with. Um, there was someone like that several years ago that, um, you know, had a lot of initial commits, had a successful summer of code, and then has since moved on to other things. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, before they moved on to other things, they continued to contributing to FreeBSD for a while, and then their situation changed. Yep. So. Got to harness that enthusiasm when it's, when the iron's hot. Yeah. Oh. Maybe we just wait for the microphone and just uh, uh, So I did some uh, uh, some mentoring like at the early stages of Google Summer of Code and uh, also s some projects worked well, some didn't. But what uh, really worked for me, well, uh, but it's much harder these days with remote work, but uh, I was looking only for local students that 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 can come to my office in Warsaw mm -hmm. and just work every day from there. Yeah. So they have like constant access. If they have questions, they just come ask. I can talk to them whenever I can, and this worked really well and actually produced some commenters later. But uh, so uh, if somebody has like uh, opportunity like this to just search for a local student. Yeah. That, and and work. This way is definitely uh, definitely better, I guess. I think that one's worth writing down. Like, I mean, it's kind of a unique situation, but uh, let's see. Let me summarize. But if it's possible, consider recruiting promising local students. You know, there's advantages. Yeah, it works basically like internship, right? If you get someone in. Yeah, there's probably some uh, some good data out there to support that claim. I mean, over the pandemic, how did like you know general university students make out when they suddenly couldn't uh, meet with people in person? I, I would expect. There was some drops in productivity. Uh, let me let me try framing the question a different way. So I think most of us or all of us are FreeBSD users here. What are some things that you're missing? What's what do you wish you know wasn't broken or wasn't missing? Maybe it's a good project idea. Or maybe you can divide it up into a into a project. Yes, yes. Um, it could be nice to have something like um, a Beehive layer for Vagrant. So may, I'm, not, I'm not sure if everyone knows what Vagrant is, but it's a, um, like a, a command line, let's say, to um, easily... Um, use VMs, let's say. So instead of like um, using VirtualBox um, from the GUI, you can have a lot of automation on the command line. So when you want to create a new, um, spawn a new VM, you just do it on the command line very easily and it populates the, the thing with everything you need and you can SSH directly. So in theory, you can do it, on every, you, can script it every, you can script everything on your own. Um, but with Vagrant, it's all automated for you. And I was always missing this on FreeBSD. So Vagrant is available, but you have to use VirtualBox as a backend for it. 
um, which not always works. And then if we had something like uh, a Beehive backend for it, we could use our native uh, virtualizations technology, and that would be nice. Um, yeah, and this could be a nice project. Yeah. So I, I think maybe another point here is that we don't necessarily always need a really high bar for projects. There's a variety of students that have different skills. And so these projects maybe, I mean, I don't know much about Vagrant or, or the amount of work that that project that Matthias suggested would take, but uh, I don't think we always have to have these projects that are really challenging. We can, we can think about or consider simpler projects too. Anything else anybody can think of that's missing that you wish they had? Maybe it's worth considering for a project? Yeah, Jake. I think some of the intimidation for FreeBSD, or at least joining the FreeBSD community, comes from the install just kicking you right into a TTY. Yeah, so um, maybe... Sorry. Uh, I know we were talking, to, yeah, with Pierre um, in the graphics meeting the other day about putting some kind of installer option for desktop environments. I think this would significantly increase the attractiveness for new users to FreeBSD. Yeah, certainly that's something that's been talked about for a long time and the, I think the foundation decided it was worth uh, putting someone behind that. So Pierre, as I mentioned earlier, is our new user land developer. And that's one of the example projects we thought about, like kind of revamping the installer. Not not necessarily changing. I mean, you know, a lot of people like our installer is great, but um, it doesn't necessarily match what everybody wants. It matches maybe what we want, but there's people that want just what Jake said. They want to be able to click a button and have whatever fancy desktop environment is is uh, in fashion these days. Well, also, I, I want to add one thing. Mm -hmm. um, Warner mentioned that a few of his students had trouble um, managing their, their commits. And I think that's an incredibly important point. It took me a, a long time to learn how to commit properly. Uh, yeah. Commit messages, fabricator reviews, um, getting it approved. All of that is... a a foreign process because a degree does not teach you that a degree doesn't teach you git yep um i think that it might be important to emphasize or at least teachers the the gsoc students about that maybe yeah so we have a, a committer's guide it's not bad but it could be better especially for newcomers maybe um i mean i guess i'm more familiar with the porter's handbook which is much more verbose i think um, so that's a good point. I think uh, we could sit down with somebody like you who's kind of just gone through this and maybe identify parts of the committer's guide that, that could be revamped for newer people. Well, what confused me specifically was I I'm not even a committer at this point. And yeah, it's point. called the committer's guide. Yeah, that's a very right? good point. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, maybe I shouldn't even be reading this. Yeah, so maybe I wish I could bring my screen up again, but we do have a, a little guide for, for Google Summer of Codes, but apparently it's not quite sufficient, and maybe it needs some, some revamping to, to, to navigate these issues. Well, how long are we scheduled? So we have 15 minutes. We can... Like the, is there any effort in like open source to to create some kind of uh, like generic configuration scheme for like all the tools so I have like so I can have like a JSON configuration of the entire system uh, does that exist somewhere or <laughs> um, that I don't have to have like separate SSHD configuration separate NTPD configuration but something that basically converts between those formats, but from like a single JSON or... So you sound like you're describing, oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. There's this Linux distribution, Nix, Nix OS. It sounds like you're describing Nix. So Nix for FreeBSD. 
I, I'm not aware of anything like that for FreeBSD, but that, I mean, there's certainly interest in that. Beyond because from FreeBSD. a vendor perspective, that would be awesome to be able to like have, uh, not to have like shell scripts to configure all the demons in the system in different way from a single file configuration, but just have this natively, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so maybe we can learn something from Nix. Like, uh, it, it certainly is appealing. I haven't And this would be also something that goes beyond FreeBSD as well. Mm -hmm. so, I don't know. Maybe some sort of coordination with Nix to get it. So I think Nix has, uh, there's another one that's similar, GUIX, I think, maybe. Um, Uh, Nix OS, and, th and then it's a package manager, and there's something called Geeks. Geeks. Yeah, G U I X. Yeah. So I don't know. So I know at least Nix is kind of connected to their Linux distribution, but there's parts of it, I think, that are distribution agnostic. Maybe there's something, there's a project there. Let me just write some keywords for myself. There is Nix OS, that is the operating system. And then Nix is a package manager. Right. And it allows you to do many different things. It's actually in the FreeBSD code. You can um, use it in, to, to some degree. Let me just say. Okay, so I'll just summarize. Um, right. So, Matthias, am I saying your name right? Matthias? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> There's Nix, the OS, and Nix, the package manager. And now that I recall, I've even been in the IRC channel, there's some FreeBSD efforts to, and it's in the ports tree, say, um, for the Nix package manager. So that might be the starting point for kind of the project that, that uh, Pavel was suggesting. Yeah, but that certainly sounds interesting, having one file that you can keep in version control and it configures your whole system. It's just your whole system configuration file rather than looking all different places. That's, that's very appealing. Yeah, Roki. Well, this is not regarding the uh, new ideas, but uh, I had uh, uh, I did and mentors you know, several years ago, and I got a feedback from my students. And uh, yes, I, I am one of the university persons, so yeah, in usual. Um, a daily basis, I am handling uh, some uh, projects uh, involving the, uh, several students. But uh, I got a feedback about the, um, when difficulties when um, engaging to the open source project as the GSOC student or uh, some similar uh, um, a scheme to uh, enter the open source world. The, the students feel uh, uh, some difficulties in the onboarding process first, and uh, after that, the he so for uh, GSOC program, the each program, each project, each uh, student uh, focuses on their own project only so there is no interaction between the students for example in mm. the, the same project even after the uh gsoc uh, program period they do not have a, a clear uh, opportunity to uh, give a talk in a conference or um, um, presenting their work in the project or uh, uh, opportunities like uh, the best they can mm -hmm. so I think it is good for us to invite the GSOC students here or other conferences to have uh, so GSOC student track, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if we can, we have, we make it um, um, consistent across the uh, multiple GSOC uh, um, uh, program and for the FreeBSD, we can get more uh, people and we can keep the students motivated to uh, participate the uh, FreeBSD community yep. for a long time. Yep. So uh, that's a uh, feedback I got from the student. Yep. That's absolutely valuable feedback. I mean, from our perspective, I mean, there's a lot of different goals for GSOC, but from our perspective, I mean, the ultimate goal is to get people introduced to FreeBSD and to stick around. So yeah, I think that's really valuable. I mean, Lee Wen's doing not necessarily, well, 
uh, and ways from GSOC. So Li Wen has done a pretty good job at that, encouraging his uh, mentees to um, continue working and present at conferences in and ways a good example. Um, we started this year, so we're aware, it's good to repeat that, we're aware of that general sentiment that we need to um, have the students engage more with the community and each other. We started off this year with all the students and mentors meeting together. It was fantastic. They all showed up, all mentors and all students. So we're trying to get more kind of collaboration and um, exposing everyone to the wider project in the community. So we got about eight minutes. I mean, I think we're fine to stop here if nobody else has any other ideas. Or we can just kind of let everybody hack a little bit and I'll stick around if anybody thinks of something. Oh, okay, never mind. We got 38 minutes. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> I don't think we have to keep going. There's no rule. No. Somebody from the internet. A man page for the ice driver. Oh, I should be um, should be watching the. And this is from. Where are you seeing this? The Dev Where? Summit. Yes, yeah, it's, it's actually this guy. <laughs> Uh, so somebody, I'm trying to find out where it's from. I think it's the the Dev Summit IRC channel. A man page for the ice driver. Yeah, that's, I mean, certainly something that's useful. There's another program called Google Summer of Docs. Is that what it's called, Benedict? Season of Docs. Google Season of Docs, yeah. So I'll put that down, though. Man page for the ICE driver. Is that still, we haven't really participated in that, have we, lately? A bit of slack, basically. Less mentors in the top two. Yeah, yeah, it's the same bottleneck. Ideas and mentors. We need to like clone Mark Johnson and Warner and Lee Wen, Ed. Just going to check uh, IRC, see if there's any more questions there. Hmm, I don't think so. So I can't connect to my usual client. The wireless here blocks certain ports. Uh, my IRC bouncer, I mean. Um, so I, I can't really see things very well here, but does anybody see any questions on the Dev Summit or any other? Yeah, I tried different ports. There's so many things that are blocked. I, I, That's what I did, oh, but okay. I couldn't find a port. Like I'd go down to like port 900 and it's still blocked. Oh, pick, pick port. Yeah, then it was blocked. I can show you like the my history of <laughs> SSH minus L. Five different ports. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was blocked too. Okay, yeah. yeah. Other with the I think the main problem, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> We can. We don't have to talk about that on the recording. I was going about to say the my security through obscurity, the port that I use on my SSH tape. Oh, and for the stream, what is yeah, it? That's what I said. I'm going to avoid. Huh? Me, you, and oh, by the way, my host is my IP address is. Jake, can I put you on the spot? Is there any other 
kind of experiences. I know we did this on the Google Summer of Code. Uh, was it a FreeBSD Friday? One of the foundation kind of events you shared some of your experiences or anything that you recall. No, no pressure if you don't have any. Any wisdom about being a student? Well, you already mentioned several times that it's just about the, the mentors, I guess. Um, I tried to direct a few friends to the Google Summer of Code ideas, and yeah, we 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 actually we had one of your University of Minnesota colleagues, but uh, we lost him to a different project. Yep. He was ranked higher in their project. I, he was still ranked pretty high in ours, so he must have been number one on the that other hmm. project. Well, he was. Um, he told me he was doing x86 assembly for them, so okay. I, <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to do that. No. <laughs> well, they ranked him higher. He he must have put in a good proposal. <laughs> um, oh. yeah, I, I think having solid ideas on the page and uh, listed mentors that are accurate would be the best because um, the biggest struggle for him was he looked at the project ideas and um emailed the mentors yeah and the mentors were unresponsive that so was one particular project that we should have um we should have nailed down earlier like the project was fine it was the mentor that wasn't fine like the mentor had moved on yeah other than that i think you covered everything okay so maybe we can uh End it here then. Yep, I think we're good. Okay, thanks everyone. Appreciate it. So we, as a community, we have a lot of history, and as a community, we're. It's true that the artifacts we produce is a bunch of source code and releases of that source code, but we're also a bunch of people, and people with individual stories. And we're a bunch of relationships between each other. And that's what makes a community is relationships between people and our friendship with each other. And hearing our different stories, at least for me, I really enjoy sharing that. What what makes each one of us unique and how it fits into kind of the big picture of FreeBSD as a source and BSD as a source. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Mike. Thank you. So I have one slide, which is basically the outline. Um, so uh, this is sort of my involvement with BSD of various flavors. Uh, I'm going to start out um, with uh, when I started um, becoming familiar with Unix. Um, I was a grad student in molecular biology at Berkeley. Oh, yes, mask. <laughs> Thank you. And um, so I worked in this lab, which was kind of two parts working on related problems. And one part was bacterial genetics, and that's where I worked. And the highest tech things we used were toothpicks and Petri plates. Um, but um, the other part of the lab was physical chemistry of the enzyme that the gene we worked on produced. And so they had these various instruments, and they had a PDP-1140 that they used to... Uh, uh, gather data from those instruments. So when I got there, the uh, system was running a sixth edition Unix with some Berkeley changes, which I didn't really know anything about at the time. Um, and I expressed some interest in the computer, so I ended up writing a Fortran program for scientific purposes. Um, and then at one point, the machine started malfunctioning and it would start writing bad blocks on the disk cartridges. Um, but only when it was running Unix. So the hardware people come in, run diagnostics, um, would work fine, would put in the next disk pack, next backup, it would write bad blocks in the middle of it. And at that time, that was fatal. So um, they kept working on the problem. Uh, and I came in one day, and they were running uh, exercises on a disk pack that was unlabeled. 
and well, we don't have any unlabeled disc packs. But I found the label on the floor in between the disc rack and the drive, and um, it was our last backup. So <laughs> uh, basically, version six was no more on that uh, computer. And we had an undergrad who was maintaining it and decided to put on uh, version seven, or it was actually sort of 2BSG at that time, which I knew nothing about. Uh, so um, this undergrad was a guy named Bill Jolitz, um, which is a name that some of you may have heard. Um, if not, uh, he was the guy who later did the 386 port that was in 4.3 Reno and 4.4, uh, and, uh, and then later 386 BSD. Uh, so at any rate, we started getting things r running again with this version 7 derived system. Uh, well, it didn't run real well on a PDP 1140. Um, 1140 didn't have separate instruction and data spaces, so it had 64K per program instead of 128K. Uh, so I helped out with putting um, overlays in various programs, things like that. But the other problem was the device drivers for the uh, scientific instruments didn't work, uh, so those had to be ported. Uh, so I ended up working on that, even though I didn't really know what a kernel was before I started. Um, and uh, so with Bill's help, I uh, figured out the device driver stuff. Um, he did some of it, and then I debugged it and fixed things up again. Um, so I ended up getting kind of sucked into that stuff. Um, so later worked on a system that was called 2.8 BSD, uh, which one of the earlier systems might have been the first one that had a complete system, including a kernel, um, and the uh, and Warner's nodding yes. Um, so before that, the BSD tapes were VI, C shell, Pascal compiler add-ons, uh, basically for Unix systems. Uh, so uh, I got started uh, cutting my my teeth on basically what was a, an ancestor of 2.8, was sort of the bits de jour from the computer center or from CS department. Uh, and later on, I worked on uh, a newer version of this uh, called 2.9 BSD, uh, which I finally got finished about the time I was supposed to finish my PhD. Uh, never did quite finish the PhD, by the way. It's a small matter of writing a thesis, but, but I got my release out. So. Yeah. so after that, I went to CSRG, which was kind of across the mining circle um, in the next building over um, in the com computer science department. Um, at a group called CSRG, a Computer Systems Research Group. Um, that was the group that had formed to develop and maintain uh, BSD, which at that time was 4BSD, um, running on the VAX. And uh, so 4.2 BSD was nearly finished when I started. Started over the summer, I've forgotten quite when. This was in um, 1983, I think. And uh, so I um, was learning about VAX Unix. Uh, I was learning about the ARPANET and uh, TCP IP, which I hadn't used yet. And uh, suddenly I was the person in charge of maintaining the TCP code and et cetera for uh, what was about to become the most popular system on the ARPANET. Uh, so that was a kind of a rapid learning experience. Um, when I started there, um, in terms of um, HR, I was Bill Joy's replacement, uh, although Bill hadn't been there for a while. He was at Sun, Sun Microsystems. Um, Sam Leffler was there and had uh, basically committed to stay until 4.2 was done. And it was basically nearly done, and I was there to replace him. So I basically replaced um, Bill Joy and Sam Leffler, which was quite a challenge. <laughs> So um, I got started working on CCP code, um, learning it and fixing a few bugs. Uh, and then um, there was this new algorithm that came out from a guy named John Nagel, uh, who worked behind one of the most tortuous paths to the internet I've ever heard of. It was a 4,800 baud least line to a 9,600 baud least line cross country um, to the ARPANET. Um, and so oddly they had problems with congestion uh, and, uh, so John, uh, like some of the better researchers later, said, well, what can I do about this, as opposed to, well, it's hopeless. 
Um, and he discovered that there are streams of small packets for things like Telnet, uh, for remote logins. Um, and so he came up with an algorithm for coalescing small packets depending on the packet round trip time. So it was kind of self-tuning. And I thought, well, maybe I can, you know, implement that. So I went and looked at the previous, at the uh, 4.2 code for TCP, and TCP output, and there was this three-line conditional. And um, I looked at it very hard and said, I think if I delete the middle conditional, I'll have the Nagel algorithm. Uh, it turned out that was right. Um, so I went, started looking more at what, what other lines can I delete? <laughs> <laughs> so at any rate, um, I, I concentrated quite a bit on the networking code while I was at Berkeley. Um, while later, uh, a guy named Van Jacobson started walking into my office from time to time. And um, he also was looking at congestion. All this time it was the ARPANET. It was kind of the latter days of the ARPANET. And there were seriously 30, 40 second round trip times on the uh, internet across the ARPANET. Um, and so, like John Nagel before him, he looked at this and said, well, we can do better. Um, traced some connections and looked at queues on gateways and discovered there were a number of retransmissions of the same thing over and over. So we started working on the retransmission code, round trip timing, things like that. And he would walk into my office and show me some new code and we'd try it out and I'd put it in the, the current working Berkeley version. Um, later on, after uh, 4.3 came out, um, then he developed some new algorithms uh, called Slow Start. A congestion avoidance algorithm that goes with it. Um, and those were extremely successful um, to the point that the IETF basically mandated them a few months after they were released, more or less. Uh, so um, that was part of what I worked on at Berkeley. Um, I got to work on some other things that were less fun, like uh, DNS, uh, which is brand new. Um, there was a version of DNS done at Berkeley called Bind, Berkeley Internet Name Domain System. And uh, it was done by a group of graduate students, three master's students, if I recall correctly, and one PhD student directing things, although he didn't write any code. Uh, and so then I went to a meeting where they kind of presented their, okay, it's all working, we're, you know, ready to go. And the guy said, who did the memory allocation part for the database said, well, he always run, wanted to run a garbage collector, write a garbage collector. So um, he decided he would have 17 byte buckets and uh, not reference count or anything or you know, keep track of it. So he could just write his garbage collector. I was like, okay, you know, this will be good. Uh, needless to say, the program needed a little work when we got it. So I ended up working on that some. Uh, this was also the time of uh, internet host requirements um, in the IETF. Um, and so I ended up going to a lot of IETF and POSIX meetings. Um, and this was probably a good thing. But at some point I realized that I was going to three or four meetings a year for each of them, and they're a week each. And then the week before was mostly prep, and the week after was catching up. And that was six months out of my year. So I decided I would start going to every other meeting since the stuff I cared about the most had been finished. Um, and uh, what this really meant in practice was, I won't go to this meeting, maybe I'll go to the next one. So I went to very few after that. Um, so we did a number of 4BSD releases um, during that time. Um, and these were all complete Unix-based systems uh, with more and more Berkeley modifications. Uh, for example, in 4.3, Reno had a new virtual memory system from MOC, uh, which was ported by Mike Hibbler at University of Utah. Uh, so uh, various people would call up from time to time and ask about certain parts of the system. Um, I specifically remember a call from Wind River Systems um, who wanted to know about our Telnet client, maybe the server, um, but they're mostly interested in the client, I think. They wanted to know if it was based on Unix code, and I said, well, I don't think so, I don't know. They said, well, can we get a copy of it? And I said, no, we don't do partial releases. We just you know, have a license for the whole thing. Uh, and that requires a Unix license, which they didn't have. So after some number of these calls, I decided, well, maybe it would be a good idea to see if these things were based on Unix code. 
and we looked at some of them and we would find little bits of things derived from like CU or something like that. It's a predecessor to TIP. Um, and so we'd fix that up, rewrite it, and usually do it much more modern way. Uh, and so eventually we put together a release called the first Berkeley Network, well, the Berkeley Networking Release. Uh, and that was available with a license, but it didn't require a Unix license. You just signed a license with the university and uh, had some terms and conditions and things. Um, and uh, then you could get this without a Unix license and unit, use it for more or, lever, more or less whatever you wanted. Um, and so we started releasing what was basically a vertical stack, vertical slice through the stack. Uh, had clients, um, it had some networking code, I think the TCP and IP code were there. Don't remember if it had any device drivers or not. Um, was not usable by itself, obviously. And once we got started on that, um, this kind of rolled along and gathered momentum. Um, and Keith Bostick started at the university and started getting people to rewrite various user-level code. Um, so we had an unencumbered version of CAT, unencumbered version of LS, and all the hard ones got written. Uh, but he kept working on it and getting more and more people involved. And we also started looking at the kernel code. Um, he put together uh, some tools to look for common code between 32V, which was the version of Unix that Vax Unix was based on, um, and our current then code, which was um, about Tahoe vintage, I think. And he found things that would match that you would never imagine. For example, um, there was a kernel profiling, um, and you would never guess that that was derived from 32V, which didn't have such a thing. But it turned out the way it worked was it hooked up to a single port serial card, and it set it for, I think it was 1200 baud with two stop bits, and then it would transmit at 109 interrupts per second. And so we would just transmit continuously nulls, and that was our 109 hertz profiling clock. Uh, and so we looked at that and said, well, this is derived from the console driver. Um, and you would never guess that if you didn't know the history of it or have this program that uh, Keith, Keith put together. Um, so we gradually filtered out which parts of the system had free software and which parts had encumbered software. So eventually this came out as the Net2 release or second Berkeley networking release. And by that time, we had kind of overshot where we wanted to be with the second iteration on this. Um, it was, it turned out it was most of the kernel. Uh, I think there were seven files missing from the kernel, um, which still were encumbered. Uh, but we looked at various parts of the code and it's like, okay, there's a bunch of lines of code in Fork that copy this, that, and the other thing from the parent process to the child process. And I looked at it and I said, you know, I've always hated that code. I wanted to rewrite it anyway. Um, instead of zeroing half the fields one at a time, why not group them and just be zero all the things that were supposed to be zero and then have the other things in a block that you'd copy and then a third block of things that you would initialize individually. Um, and so we put that in and then, ta-da, Keith's program produced no commonality between our version of Fork and the 32V version of Fork. So it wasn't just a matter of getting rid of licensed code, it was sometimes getting rid of some of the oldest and most obsolete code in the system. Uh, so uh, there were quite a few utilities, uh, uh, various parts of the user program, uh, all the networking utilities obviously by that time. Uh, and so I was a little bit afraid that we had gotten ahead of ourselves um, I wanted to come up with new releases with gradually more and more stuff uh, so that AT&T or USL would not be too surprised if somebody came out with a free version of the operating system that actually ran. And we came perilously close to doing that with Net2. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I guess there was one other thing I wanted to, oh, two other things I wanted to mention about my time at Berkeley. Uh, one was the origins of the uh, Berkeley copyright, um, you know, with, in particular the license notice that's with the copyright notice in the files. Um, in 4.2 BSD, there were no copyright notices at all. 
32V was protected by trade secret. Um, BSD was subject to the 32V license, so it was kind of transitive in a way. Um, but I looked at a certain company's version of 4.2 BSD and a file that they had modified in two ways. Somebody had added a comment saying, I don't understand this. <laughs> and they had added their copyright. And you look at it and you say, this looks like it was developed by this other company, when in fact it was developed by Berkeley. So I got annoyed at this, uh, talked to the Berkeley lawyers eventually, and we decided to do what's called a copyright recapture. We put copyright notices in the files and then send out notices to the 4.2 licensees saying, we inadvertently shipped these you know, 10,000 files without copyright notices, you know, please put them in. Um, <laughs> which, of course, we had done. Um, so we managed to do this, I think it was for 4.3 BSD, got the timing such that the new release was out, and then we could say, you know, edit in this license notice into these, this list of files attached, or upgrade to the new release. Um, so that was a little more palatable. Um, so it was a, an iterative process developing this license. Um, it got longer and longer the more times I talk to the lawyers about it, and then, uh, you know, and they, oh yeah, we have to put this paragraph in with no license or um, indemnification, um, and it has to be all in caps. <laughs> Why? Well, that's the established legal tradition. So we uh, put that in. Keith Bostic was the one who put the copyright notices into the 10,000 or so files. Um, and after doing it a couple of times, he decided enough is enough. He would put a percent copyright percent or something like that into the sources and then have RCS insert it. So uh, it was no big deal then making the changes to the license. So um, I don't know how many people know it, but I'll actually take credit for the uh, BSD license. Uh, oh, and one other thing. Uh, um, uh, there were a number of things that we added during that time frame, um, things like disc labels and Malik and Kirk being most of Malik um, and various things like that. Um, one thing that I added, which was just kind of a small fraction of what it is now, is syskittle. Um, and I had no idea where it was going to go, um, but it seemed like having an extensible interface would be a good thing. So uh, in general, looking back at those systems, um, they were still very primitive by current standards, uh, but I think we made a certain amount of progress in uh, making them a little more modern. At any rate, around the time that 4.3 Reno came out, 4.4 was making good progress, and Net2 is out, um, a little company called BSDI, Berkeley Software Design, started up and um, had two employees uh, who proceeded to fill in the seven missing files from the kernel for Net2 um, got the thing booting and running and um, started developing drivers and other things. And before long, um, I was talking to the um, head of that company, president, and uh, he said, we need a system architect, and it's now or never. So I decided, well, this sounds like fun, and they would let me live wherever I wanted because um, it was associated with UUNet. They had networking everywhere, pretty much or they'd put it everywhere. Um, and so I went to work for BSDI um, as the chief system architect. Um, he insisted that it had to be chief system architect because when they were going out talking to venture capitalists, they wouldn't necessarily understand that there was just one system architect. So a system with seven employees had a chief system architect. <laughs> uh, so, uh, there was some stuff that you probably heard about that uh, happened not long after that. Um, one of the things that may have instigated it was that BSDI started advertising this complete uh, B BSD system that run and you could get source code, and it was available at nominal charge, including with source code. Uh, nominal charge went 500 or 1,000, 500 I think for binaries and 1,000 including source. Um, there was one little problem in the ads. Um, the 800 number that you would call for information was 1-800-ITS-UNIX. Um, 
Now, he, he was smart. He talked to the lawyers ahead of time and said, is this defensible? And he showed him some materials that he had. Um, and uh, the lawyers looked at it and said, yeah, it's defensible. We're about to ask the second question, how much will it cost to defend it? <laughs> <laughs> so needless to say, there was this little lawsuit. Um, USL filed suit against BSDI for a, a number of things. Um, but mostly for releasing their proprietary source code, trade secret source code. Um, there's one little issue. BSDI didn't do that. Berkeley did, UC Berkeley. So about the time we were hopefully going to have the suit thrown out because we didn't do the thing they were alleging, um, they refiled the suit against UC Berkeley as well as us. Um, and so the next couple of years were... Um, interesting as the lawsuit proceeded. Um, and I think Kirk has talked and written about it a lot more than I have. He was more on the inside because the university um, could see various things that we couldn't. So let's see. What else did I want to mention? So BSDI did, I think, the first commercially supported BSD system. Um, did a lot of drivers and various other things. And gradually system grew uh, to be relatively advanced for its time. Um, and then we got some pressure from customers and people who wanted to use it for development um, to do multiprocessing. As you can now buy these PCs with two processors. And uh, so this seemed, you know, plausible. Um, we had some contractors uh, who wanted to do it and we didn't have time. So they did a, an initial version, which was mostly asymmetric. Um, so there was kind of master slave. Either kernel could run, either system could run in the kernel, but only one at a time. The other one could just run user code. Uh, so then we took that internally and uh, gradually developed it, and got the first 80 percent or so of the project done to the point that it was up and running, and um, a lot of the kernel was multi-threaded. Um, and then there were various interesting things going on, including um, talks of um, open source software and how we could collaborate with open source. And so for various and sundry reasons, uh, BSDI agreed to give the multiprocessing code to FreeBSD, um, which was a, I thought, nice contribution. Um, and so FreeBSD then picked this up, got it put in, and discovered that there were still some more things that there were to be done. So FreeBSD has gotten the next 90% done. Um, so now there's just 90% left, I guess. <laughs> but in fact, it's uh, really made quite a lot of progress. Uh, so my next job was not really um, affiliated with BST, uh, but it did use BST. And so there were a couple of things I wanted to mention. Um, I went to work for a firewall company called uh, Secure Computing Corporation, which happened to be in Minneapolis, which is where I worked and lived. Uh, and uh, they had a, a firewall called Sidewinder. Um, it was based on BSD OS, as it was called at the time. And uh, so I went to work for them. Um, they were getting their stuff working with multiprocessing. They had some kernel code. Uh, but about this time, um, and they didn't know it at, at first, uh, but the, the BSDI uh, code base wasn't going forward. Um, the company that had acquired the software assets um, had decided they didn't know what they were doing. At least this is my understanding. Um, and so they decided to just say, okay, we're now finished with the SMP version. Um, here's the 5.0, 5.1 releases, and you're on your own. Um, so this was not what Secure Computing wanted to hear, but FreeBSD was working on it. So they needed a new operating system for um, their firewalls, and I was available to help work on it. So um, I worked for them. Uh, it was actually a succession of companies, um, all of the same group, same product, um, which were uh, Secure Computing, and they were acquired by McAfee. Um, they became Intel Security and acquired by Intel, um, and then Intel took them internally, or that group internally, um, and then Intel spun it off to Forcepoint, where I worked until a year and a half ago. Um, so a couple of things worth mentioning. 
Um, one is that it was a highly secure system. It had a thing called type enforcement, uh, which they had patented and uh, were the only ones to have for some time. Um, if you haven't heard of it, it's a predecessor of SE Linux. Uh, so type enforcement means that um, ob objects have types and creators. Uh, creator is kind of like an owner, but it's the owner's security group. Uh, and then processes have roles, um, which are the um, creator type for the objects they produce. And there's a database, um, which was statically compiled ahead of time, um, which said who can do what to what, um, including can you fork? Can you exec this other domain? Can you exec that domain? Um, can you uh, elevate yourself to this domain? Can you run the startup software? No. Um, can you modify the disk? No. Um, and so it was really a very secure system. And uh, that was something that, of course, had to be preserved when going from BSD OS into FreeBSD system. Um, fortunately, at this time, the Mac framework was out. Um, and so we put this mostly into the Mac framework by writing a TE module for the Mac framework. Uh, and that did most of the work. Um, and so we ended up having a few if defs for um, if you have type enforcement, then make this extra call if somehow the Mac framework didn't have what we needed. Um, but there were relatively few of those. Um, so that was um, fairly fun. Uh, there was a little talk of releasing that code. Um, Robert Watson asked about it at one point. Um, he had developed the Mac framework um, and uh, was interested in having some serious examples of how to use it. Um, and he had gotten little bits of code from us for some modifications we had made to the framework. Um, but unfortunately, I never got to push that through. But there was some code, like TCP improvements, that did make it from secure computing and successors uh, into FreeBSD. Uh, for example, we modified TCP so that it could use the same port for connections to multiple destinations, um, which it didn't initially do. Um, and so um, I packaged some of those things up, sent them off to George Neville Neal, who I knew from a previous life or two. Um, and uh, so he he would have some questions and and I think I gave him diffs against FreeBSD. So it was you know sort of like a pull request except in email. Um, so uh, George got tired of putting in things for me. Um, and so um, he decided I should become a committer. So I finally became a FreeBSD committer in 2017, um, which given the lifetime of FreeBSD and length of time I'd been using it was probably a little late. But. So in any case, um, I retired about a year and a half ago. Uh, and so now I've had more time for FreeBSD, although not as much as I thought I would. Uh, so um, I've been cleaning up various things, uh, sort of cleaning up messes that I'd left at Berkeley <laughs> some time before. Uh, for example, the class A and B and C network code uh, masks and shifts to break things apart. And there was a bunch of code that would say, well, looking at an address, treat it as a class A address, and then see if the network number is 127. Um, if so, then it's loopback. Um, it's like, well, you know, somebody had already added a is it loopback macro. That would be much nicer to have in user programs. So uh, I spent a little time cleaning up that sort of thing. Um, so um, I had, had been doing some FreeBSD work before I retired. Um, one example is the GE net driver, Ethernet driver for the Raspberry Pi 4, um, which I uh, cribbed mostly from NetBSD after attempting to do it on my own and discovering that, um, well, I knew this, but um, doing uh, drivers without hardware documentation is painful, even if you have other examples. Um, so um, looking at the NetBSD code, it's like, well, okay, here's a series of of uh, calls to initialize the chip. And you know, I thought I was doing something pretty much equivalent, but why not put in exactly that sequence? And lo and behold, it worked. So um, debugged once is you know, ready to pick from. So uh, 
lately I've um, done a handful of uh, other cleanups. Dirk was commenting that um, I seem to be working on a lot of different things. That seemed to be true. Um, I had a couple of larger projects that I started on. They've both been pretty much on hold lately. Um, one is um, helping out with the uh, port to the Mac Mini with the M1 chip. Uh, Kyle Evans has been working on that, and I worked on various bits of that code. Um, and um, interested in getting back to it now that he's made some good progress. Um, and also, I thought it was interesting that Intel had two different kinds of CPU cores in some of their newer chips, and performance cores and efficiency cores got mentioned in Mark's um, session this morning. Um, and so I started looking at that, decided to um, build a system based on one of those chips. And I have some bits of code that do some of what I want, but it still doesn't work well enough with the rest of the ULE framework. So there's a lot left to be done there. And um, part of the problem is not just to push things to the performance cores, but put the appropriate things on the efficiency cores. And it's kind of different on Intel, as far as I can tell. It's not really about efficiency, it's just lower performance and shared caches. Um, but it, it turns out those cores are still faster than putting a second thread on a um, performance core. So it's kind of a three level hierarchy now. You've got performance core running one thread, then the efficiency core, and then the performance core running a second thread. Um, and so um, I'm hoping to get back to that as well and want it to be generic, so I want it to work on the Intel chips and on ARMS, including the Mac Mini at some point. So um, I think with that, I'll open it to questions. Oh, a question. I don't know that it's okay. Um, how did you get involved with working on? I think it was the four four book you are a co author on, right? For which? Uh, the the D, the four four DNI book. Or is it four three? Sorry, the I design and implement my ears are not good. That's okay. The the design and implementation of BSD book. How was what was that like to get involved with that? How did or how did you get roped into that? Um, working on that project and maybe which parts of the like which chapters if you remember did you work on? Um, well, let's see. In the four three book, I did uh, network related stuff, in particular the TCP chapter. Um, there were a couple of chapters, um, sort of lined up for the networking framework, socket layer, and things like that, which Sam wrote, uh, but. I decided that there really needed to be a, a chapter about TCP itself as an example implementation, even though it was supposed to be a generalized framework. And then I think I wrote the TTY chapter because nobody wanted to do it. And uh, I forgot something else. Um, and then with 4.4 book, um, I've sort of forgotten. I know I updated the TCP chapters, uh, chapter. Um, I forgot what else I did in the 4.4 book. Do you remember? That was a long time ago. That was three books ago. Yeah, not for me. It wasn't three books ago for me, but um, it's still a long time ago. So, um, yeah, I, there had been talk about doing a book for a long time. There was talk about doing a book about 4.2. Um, and somebody talked to, I think it was Addison Wesley. Um, yeah, and... Um, and um, they approached USL and said, you know, Berkeley, some Berkeley people would like to write a book about 4.2. Would you approve it? And they said, well, write the book and then we'll tell you. <laughs> Needless to say, the book didn't get written. Ah, good point. Okay, so there was this nice progression of releases, um, 4.0 BSD, or I think it was just called 4 BSD, then 4.1 BSD, 4.2 BSD, 4.3, which came out somewhat later for 
interesting reasons that had to do with the funding agency. Um, and then um, there was a planned 4.4 BST, uh, which eventually came out, but it was going to have a new VM system, which it did. But when we came out with Tahoe, there was no new VM system. There were various other things that um, we wanted to have in 4.4. So um, since we were only some fraction of the way through the design, um, we decided we'd put out a, an incremental release. And among other things, it ran on some new hardware. Um, 4.2 ran on one platform. Um, well, 4.2, as you got it from Berkeley, ran on one platform, which was the VAX. Uh, now, it so happened that it also ran on Sun platforms, and they used similar source code organization, and source code organization was set up for multiple architectures. But we wanted a proof in the BSD release, um, and so uh, we got started on a platform called the CCI Power 6, um, which was kind of the uh, VAX killer of its time. And the code name for that was Tahoe, the ifdefs um, macro was ifdef Tahoe. So um, we called it the Tahoe release. We didn't want to call it the CCI release of any more than we called the original the um, VAX or the um, digital, like, digital um, equipment system. Corporation release. So we called this release 4.3 Tahoe because that was the biggest new feature in it. And it was kind of a, well, it's part way through. Um, and so it's not quite 4.4 yet, but um, we'll continue. Um, 4.3 Reno um, sounds slightly analogous if you know your Northern California geography. Um, Lake Tahoe and Reno are not far apart, um, but it, it's different um, derivation entirely. 4.4 uh, was not done um, still, but the new VM system was in and working. Um, and we had gotten some funding that included a string that, um, well, you know, they could get incremental releases um, to look at, but they couldn't ship them, um, except that we said, well, whatever we ship by this date, you can ship it. Um, and so when that date was about to arrive, we decided, okay, it's time for a release. Um, didn't want to release it to just one funding organization. Um, so the idea was that it was not 4.4 yet, had some new features, it wasn't done. Um, so if you wanted to run it in production, it would be a gamble. Well, you go to Lake Tahoe, it's probably for skiing, then you go across the border into Nevada for, to Reno, and that's where you do your gambling. So that was the derivation of the name 4.4 Reno. Um, and then 4.4. Or four three Reno, so um, obviously four four came out eventually, and then four four light. Warner, just a, a quick follow up. A four, you said Power Six. Does that have anything to do with Power PC stuff later, or it was just Power Six because it was cool? Um, I don't know where they came up with the name, but it was not related to Power PC. Um, I never looked at the instruction set carefully but I've heard that it's sort of the VAX instruction set byte swapped. Um, oh, and, and it was um, opposite byte order, if I recall correctly. Um, and other than that, it was very VAX-like. VAX had three memory regions, um, which we used for user stack. Then there was an unused area, which was used for supervisor and VMS, um, and then the kernel area. Well, they had three user areas plus Kernel. So it was a very VAX-like architecture. Uh, it was VME bus. Um, I think it was VME. Um, so uh, it was a good next step for BSD, and it was quite a bit faster than the VAXs we had. Um, and the company was very cooperative. They gave us their 4.2 port. Um, we ended up rewriting more drivers than we cared to when we brought it in, but um, <clears throat> it was still a pretty solid machine, and it was the basis for most of our work for quite a while. And then uh, 68,000 port got done at some point. Um, I think HP did that and contributed it, uh, if I recall correctly. Yeah, I think so. The, there's all kinds of HP support in the 4.4 sources, so. Yeah. Well, sometimes with, with HP you, copyrights. Uh, put something in to, to show that something is general enough, it's almost but not quite general enough. So there were remaining if def Tahoe's 
sort of scattered around. But usually if we had the time, we would sort of split things out into a machine dependent function, and even if it was a small function. Um, so most of those things got done in a reasonably good way. But um, when you're trying to um, engineer software and do a little research at the same time, it's kind of hard to do both. So rather than um, sort of f finish every last bit um, in terms of production quality and making it all look nice, sometimes it was like, well, let's get this other driver done. So it's, even in a university, it can be pragmatic sometimes. True, true. I, I always wondered why there wasn't another town in Nevada that you had uh, named the release after. <laughs> Uh, you know, um, a four a four three BSD Elkhart or something, you know. But I, I don't know how to tie that back in. Well, there wasn't another release uh, or good time to do a release. I don't think between four three Reno and four four, uh, uh, and the lawsuit intervened in there at some point. But yeah, it was after four four the first one came out because then you guys did four four light to get rid of the files that the lawsuit objected to or to put the right. Right. Markings on the files that yeah, I wasn't wanted. in on those negotiations, but yeah. um, since I couldn't, other questions. So I have a question from IRC. Um, uh, Daniel asks, uh, "Does Mike remember if any of the folks involved with the TCP implementation in Linux?" And then he gives some names um, of Fred. Van Kempen, Mark Evans, Corey Minyard, and Florian at La Roche. I'm going to butcher the name. Um, if they ever got in contact with you, I guess he's trying to ask how much um, Linux's TCP IP stack might have been kind of be a descendant of or influenced by the BSD stack. So you're, as far as you're aware. Um, I don't remember any contact um, with Linux people um, other than I ran into one or two of them at conferences sometimes. Um, um, I didn't even spend the time to look at the Linux code when it first came out, um, see what it looked like. Um, I don't, that, that was, a lot of that was during the time of the lawsuit. And um, I, I know that some other places, apparently including Microsoft, had strict rules that people should not look at Berkeley code during the time of the lawsuit, even though there was no dispute about, say, TCP. Um, so, uh, and eventually, I became convinced that they really, well, it sure had the look and feel in some cases, uh, like the Telnet client and things like that. Sure seemed to act like the Berkeley one, but, uh, um, but in terms of Linux, no, I, I'm not sure what yeah. they looked at. I don't know if it became the Linux TCP client, but I do know there was a four, three, um, TCP port to Linux at one point or in the early days. It crashed like hell all the time, so I didn't run it much. And there was another, like University of, of Uppsala or something else that would eventually become the descendant of that, would eventually be the TCP stack in Linux. And I ran that and it was more solid. But the user land stuff seemed to be more Berkeley ports than the actual stuff in the kernel. Mm -hmm. When all the dust shook out, there's some interesting, uh, there was at least one uh, flame war about, you know, hey, you took my code and sawed off my copyrights and tried to pass it off as your own with, <laughs> the, with the original Berkeley port. And I, at the time, couldn't evaluate that one way or the other, but it, mm. it was uh, a lot of acrimony at the time. And yeah. I don't know if it was legit or for other reasons. Mm. You, you know, I mean, this is a legit IP complaint or these two people hate each other and they're using this code as an excuse to argue, which happened a lot in the uh, Linux BSD wars of the time. So, BSD TCP code has been in a lot of interesting places. Um, what, what's the most interesting place? Um, the most interesting one that I was personally involved with um, was, um, I, I mentioned uh, secure computing and its successors. Um, and at one of them, I forget which one, um, they bought another firewall company um, called Stonesoft, um, which was very big in the European market. Um, it was based on Linux, 
and um, had this big kernel module that you plugged in to do a lot of security related stuff. Um, and um, I ended up working on that system a little bit. Um, but one of the things that we did is to port some Sidewinder features to it. Um, once they announced end of sale of Sidewinder, um, they wanted to pull people into their other firewall. Um, and so we uh, ported the proxy framework and the proxy framework had some hacks in TCP. Well, they didn't do hacks in TCP in Linux. Um, they had all their stuff in this kernel module. So um, I ported the TCP into user mode in Linux. Um, it was linked with the uh, proxy code. Um, and due to some packet sharing between the kernel and user space, it didn't really involve any unnecessary copying. Um, but it, it was in VAX VMS um, and uh, Wollongong Gong and other systems. Uh, some of it was in the Wind River. I, I worked at Wollongong Gong on their TCP IP product for VMS. Thankfully not Eunice, but as close as I got. <laughs> Which the code was kind of crazy bolted in in weird ways, so. Yep. I, I had occasion to look at some of it as an expert system in a, um, well, it was a lawsuit, but it was settled in arbitration. But I got pulled in as an expert witness and ended up doing a bunch of research for them, uh, researching the source code and stuff. Eventually, it turned out that it was decided based on licensing. Uh, but I had to figure out how to explain similarity between two pieces of code to some arbitrators. And so I kept coming up with, you know, like diff minus uh, D, um, show if deft code, and the lawyer said, no, they'll never understand it. I finally came up with something. Um, I printed one, put inserted spaces into the code. Right. I printed one of them in blue, one in red, and then superimposed them in a bunch of it turned purple. Um, so they thought the arbitrators would actually understand that. But it turned out to have nothing with how this case was decided. So when all the you know, the BSD copyright uh, notice was being designed, the uh, it just kept getting longer and longer and longer. And at some point, it was going to be like two pages. And especially in those days where a lot of these things would be printed out, you'd have a header file that was half a page long, and then you're going to have two pages of copyright. And I remember at some point, you going into the lawyers and having a temper tantrum and saying, you've got to get this down to half a page maximum. And somehow, <laughs> you made that stick. Yeah, um, I wasn't very happy about it either. Um, I do remember one day when I was on the phone with the lawyers, and uh, they would wanted some things added. And I hung up the phone and um, let go with a loud expletive. And a couple of people came running and said, what, what's wrong? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, just that I talked to the lawyers and they, oh, yeah, we have to add this. So they, they loved adding things. And, but, and you managed to talk them down to, you know, I remember you had the thing on your desk and you were like marking stuff out, like we don't need this and this and this and this. And finally, yep. you down to that thing and somehow got to the loser. Yep. Yeah, the, the part that, um, they didn't modify was the uh, list of terms and conditions, um, which included two clauses that people claim were contradictory. Uh, one was the advertising clause, um, and one, one of them said you had to uh, mention it. The products mentioning features or use in advertising you had to say that it was um, Berkeley code derived, um, but then it was you can't use the name of the university. Um, so it, yeah. I, th I should have said, except according to, you know, whatever. But I never saw anybody mentioning things like that in ads anyway, so it was a moot point. Um, so it's fine when they 
decided to get rid of what was it, clause three. And that was the advertising clause they got rid of, right? <laughs> was that your doing or was that somebody else's um, doing? Um, that was my doing. I mean, the lawyers had approved it. But, oh, you mean getting rid of it? <laughs> getting rid of it. Um, no, I was gone from Berkeley at that oh, time. Oh, okay. I don't know if Kirk was involved or not. Um, yeah, there was a, a guy in charge of licensing and things like that. I've forgotten exactly what he did. Um, who's the guy who had to sign off on that kind of stuff? And uh, so it was a little tricky getting him to understand what we were doing um, for some time. But he was fairly reasonable once you, you know, explained to him what we were trying to accomplish. Um, in this case, we were trying to get due credit to Berkeley, even if other companies modified the code and say, I don't understand this, and added their copyright. Can you tell us something about the development of uh, UDP? Let me get a little closer. Yeah. That doesn't feed into the room, just into the... The people on, at home can hear you, but... Okay. Um, can you tell us something about UDP? Was it developed, uh, yeah, together with TCP, or was it completely different people? Have you been involved with it? Um, the question is about um, UDP, whether it was developed by different people than TCP, uh, or if it was done at the same time. Um, as far as I know, they were um, always in the system in parallel. Um, that actually sort of gets into the background for um, why 4.3 was delayed. Uh, the, there was a company called BBN, both Baranek and Newman, that was under contract to DARPA to develop the TCP IP code for BSD. Um, and Berkeley was under contract to do the socket framework and various other things um, in 4.2. And so Berkeley got a pre-release. This, this is before I was at Berkeley. Well, before I was in the CS department. Um, Berkeley got a pre-release from BBN of the TCP code, and I assume UDP came with it at the time. Um, they, they were all side by side, as far as I know. Um, and it worked, but there were some issues. It was done as kind of a formal state machine. Um, so there was a state and indirect calls into a state machine. And um, performance was not great. Um, there was a certain amount of copying involved, which of, of course is not the best way to, uh, not the only way to make your networking code slow, um, but it's the easiest. <laughs> um, so um, Bill Joy in particular, and later Sam, uh, spent a fair amount of time optimizing the TCP code rewriting things, um, making it turn into case statements instead of indirect calls, and coalescing common code, things like that. Um, and they made a bunch of changes to mBuffs, which are the buffers that are used by the network stack, um, so that it would be easier to do things without copying um, and without having a whole chain of little things for a big packet. Um, so they added clusters and trailer encapsulations, if you remember those. Um, so then, sometime later, BBN came back and said, okay, we're done with the TCP IP code that DARPA contracted for. And Berkeley said, um, no thanks, we've got one we like. Um, so there was a certain amount of bad blood. And at the time, 4.3 was nearly finished. Um, we met with DARPA, as happened periodically. And DARPA said, well, about this other code, we paid for it. We want you to ship it. And we said, well, there's some problems with that. <laughs> um, so there was a certain controversy, and DARPA decided to do a sort of a bake-off. Bake and uh, there was a guy at the Ballistic Research Labs, um, which is an uh, army site, who used BSD. And so he did a bunch of tests and said, well, in this particular performance test, the BBN code was ahead, but the BSD code caught up while the BBN code was rebooting. 
so that was kind of the end of it. Um, but it probably delayed 4.3 by a year or more. Um, other stuff got done, so it was a better release, but it wasn't what we wanted to spend our time waiting for. Can you tell some more about uh, BSDI and BSDOS? How many people were working on, on this? BSDI? Yeah, yeah. And um, well, it's, it's, when I um, started at BSDI, it was seven people, all engineers. Um, well, no, I guess there was one manager by then. I guess he started just before I did. Um, and. Uh, I'm not sure how many people it was when I left. Um, it included salespeople and marketing and um, quite a few staff um, in the office to process orders, support people. Um, I think there were about 20 engineers um, by the time BSDI as a software organization ended, um, and probably 30, 35 or so in the company. Um, we did quite a bit with what we had. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. Um, I can't really think of much um, it happened between BSDI and FreeBSD. Um, I was busy with the BSDI stuff and wasn't really paying attention to FreeBSD. Um, I would guess that the FreeBSD people probably figured that we weren't getting paid to help them. So um, basically, at the time, it was like, well, we're going to do a commercial version, commercially supported, but you can get source code for a reasonable price. And they were aimed at um, embedded systems, high-end embedded systems, like the Sidewinder firewall or things like that. Um, so I think we were aiming for somewhat different markets, but uh, people probably know the story of um, uh, 386 BSD, but um, it turns out the guy who did 386 BSD, Bill Jolitz that I mentioned, uh, was actually one of the original BSDI employees, and they came to a parting of the ways. Um, and then John is laughing. He's heard something. <laughs> um, but um, so he decided that he was also going to fill in the missing seven kernel files and produce a running system and make it free. So, and of course, it was inevitable that such a thing would happen. And the barrier to entry was not that large. Although, for example, um, one of the files that was missing was, I forgot what it's called now, but it was basically the buffer cache. Um, and so he filled it in with a buffer cache that didn't cache, but you could read through. Um, so it was very, very simple at first. Um, but then other things like, um, well, there was a, a patch kit, which eventually turned into NetBSD when Bill was not br bringing patches back in. So NetBSD sprang up, and then FreeBSD, and much later, OpenBSD. Um, so there was, unfortunately, a certain amount of fragmentation in the BSD market. But different people have different goals and different personalities. But yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of much crosstalk between um, BSDI and FreeBSD um, until, um, well, I wasn't involved in most of this, but um, basically um, BSDI uh, bought um, Walnut Creek CD-ROM, um, which was involved with, with FreeBSD. And this is when they were you know, sort of talking about open source and trying to figure out how they wanted to relate to open source. So we actually had people working for the same company um, who worked on FreeBSD. Um, but that was still fairly much at arm's length. Um, and so um, 
and there was continuing discussions internally on, you know, what things should we give away, what things should remain proprietary. Um, and it was possible that we might have done something that was more like, um, oh, I forgot the name of the company now, um, that did um, Linux with support um, and hardware. Um, and uh, so uh, BSDI actually bought a hardware company, which uh, was known as IX Systems. Um, and then, and then um, after a while, due to various and sundry reasons, sold the software uh, division to Wind River, uh, which thought they were buying FreeBSD. Although I don't know that they were very kind to BSDI long term, but uh, I, I do recall one story from those days um, from the Walnut Creek CD-ROM side. We, we did have some interesting discussions between the OS teams. I think you're one of the nice people, but I, there was one person I think who might have put a powered by FreeBSD sticker in a rather indiscreet location um, in his home um, as a form of not liking FreeBSD, but that was definitely not you. But there was some tension, I think, between the teams. I, that is the one we got the drop on Builder, the, uh, the drop of BSDOS 5.0 that really helped us out. Um, that was very generous of you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, we really appreciated that. Yeah, so there was sort of confusion all around as far as I could tell. Um, but I didn't find out until later that Wind River thought they were buying FreeBSD. Um, they were buying, you know, yes, yeah. what had come from uh, Walnut Creek CD-ROM, um, but they didn't fully understand there were two complete systems there, I think. Uh, actually, there's one guy who did, and I think he's the guy who pushed the sale through, and he might have been gone not long after that. Oh, I, I might know who you're, yeah. Um, I can't remember his name now. It's Tom something. I should, or... it'll come to me later yeah. today. It's interesting because from my, what I felt like on the other side is we actually felt like Wind River understood BSD US better because of it being commercial as opposed to open source. And that when they bought FreeBSD, they really had no idea what they to do with an open source operating system or how to monetize that. Right. Um, but I guess they actually probably didn't know what to do with either one of those. Yes. <laughs> so the hardware company ended up, I, I guess it was spun off or something. Yeah, I think it was Systems Telnet before. When it was when 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 the three of us merged, I think they were called Telnet, and then when they got spun out, that's when they got called IX Systems. I think, um, maybe. Yeah. All, all I know is that after I left, there were some lawsuits, and they managed to use up most of the remaining assets of the company. The lawyers got it all, um, <laughs> and eventually got a check, which was a threefold return on my investment for ten years of work. <laughs> um, and it wasn't that big of an investment, so it wasn't that big a return. John, I think the names were right, but when many people try a system like that, it's where I was sort of when I started. Well, there's, um, I won't go into it here. There were some interesting non technical people in the company, one of whom ended up at IX Systems. Um, so I remember the chain. Well, there's more stories. You won't tell those stories, <laughs> especially not on a recorded medium. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anything else on IRC? Um, well, Mateus in the room doesn't want to walk out and use the mic. Um, <laughs> he can ask his question directly. <laughs> um, so I have a question regarding the release names. Why would you use a slash in a release name if you cannot use it in a file name? Uh, in slash and what? Like BSD slash OS. It looks like a very annoying oh. file name. Um, I hadn't actually thought about that. <laughs> if, if anybody couldn't hear it in the room, uh, the question is why I'd use a slash in the name of a system like BSD. Well, it was originally BSD slash 386, 
um, and uh, later BSTOS, um, and why use a slash in the name? Um, I guess because the marketing people did it. Was it annoying to Pardon? deal with? Was it annoying to deal with? Um, no, we didn't have a directory called BSTOS um, since the whole thing was BSTOS. But, um, I will mention uh, why it got changed from BST386 to BSTOS. Um, and that's because we had so many questions about when are you going to support 486? <laughs> it already does. It always has. <laughs> it's just the system that it came from. So, so BSTOS and... Uh, um, so BSDOS ended up um, running on i386, um, well, 486, uh, PowerPC, Spark. I think it was Spark 64, but I don't remember for sure. Um, we hired the people who did some of these. Um, well, the PowerPC port was done from scratch, I guess. But. So yeah, BSDI was targeting the embedded market um, as much as anything. One more. One more? Right. So the so the SMP code uh, BSDI contributed. This was for FreeBSD 3.0, the user land multi. This was for 5.0, the kernel multi. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jack, I can talk about that one first. Um, so. Well, Mike. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'll try to best of my memory try to describe what I remember of um, the code that we got from BSDOS 5. I don't know if it was a pre-release of 5 or actual 5.0. Um, it was probably a pre-release from I 5. Think, I feel like it was a pre-release. So I, I wasn't involved in the meeting, which turned out to be very ironic later on. Um, but I remember one of the things that was very kind of innovative and Caused a lot of heartburn initially um, for FreeBSD trying to the port the framework that BSDOS had adopted. Um, is y'all did some very interesting optimizations for interrupt threads. You had a uh, you had first wrestled with the idea of running using interrupt threads for handlers, and that's why FreeBSD adopted that same approach for um, not wanting to use not having all mutex as block interrupts, but only certain. Uh, mutex is block interrupts, and, and so and so in general, for all the things that device driver interrupts want to interrupt handlers want to do, like the like enter the network stack, we didn't want to run all that with interrupts disabled, or, or you didn't, and, and we followed the same approach. Um, so you wanted a thread context so that if you could block or lock inside a, a device driver interrupt handler, but you were very worried about the latency, an extra full context switch would impose on interrupts. So you had some kind of crazy, you had an initial slow version, which is all FreeBSD got done, uh, which was to actually always do a full context switch. But then you had um, a system of, uh, you had like an optimized way that if at the time you took an interrupt, you could kind of borrow the stack, of the, the current thread and run for a while. And if it didn't actually do a context switch or do something kind of expensive, it would just stay on that stack and kind of defer and do a very cheap, simple context switch. Like just swap a few registers and call the function for the ISR, and then if the mm -hmm. interrupt handler actually like blocked on a lock, then you had a way of unwinding it and kind of recovering gracefully in a way. Um, and we didn't port all that. That was a very complex thing that we we never quite adopted, um, but but led to lots of internal discussions. Around this time, there was also which was a FreeBSD quirk. Um, when Intel released Opinium, I guess they had done. Or yeah, I guess it was the Pinium Four. The Pinium Four. Um, they had done some kind of analysis to decide what instructions were worth optimizing versus which ones could maybe kind of be handled in a slower path, like in microcode. And the, I guess the software they had profiled did not use the CLI instruction to disable interrupts, so that instruction was pretty slow. So there was a lot mm -hmm. of heartburn about the fact that in our, our naive version of, of interrupt threads, we would just disable interrupts with CLI, and there was all this stress and heartburn over trying to optimize for the Pinium 4 to not use this really slow instruction that the Pinium 3 and, and the successors, the core and so forth, didn't have this penalty problem. <laughs> so it ended up not being a, a, a thing to worry about. But I remember in FreeBSD land, that was very fresh, like a big source of contention in some of the early debates about how we should structure interrupt threads and so forth really centered around 
that type of stuff. I would say interrupts are among the trickiest subject in SMP at all. Um, certainly the previous interrupt strategy was not um, going to work in an SMP system. Oh, yes. Um, the SMP work was mostly done by two people in Colorado Springs, mm -hmm. um, sort of coincidentally. They both worked from home, um, even though they were in the city where the office was. Um, but engineers didn't go into the office <laughs> those days in VSDI. Because if the rest of us work from home in various places, why, why shouldn't they? Um, so um, one of the guys did a lot of the design stuff. Um, and he had worked at Cray, um, or Cray Computer maybe, um, before he worked at BSGI. Um, Cray. Was that Chuck? No, that was um, Eric Versagne. Oh, okay. uh, Chuck Patterson was the other one. Um, as an aside, um, Chuck Patterson worked for me for, I don't know, a year or a year and a half before I met him face to face. Um, wow. Since we both worked from home. And I may or may not have been in the Colorado Springs office, but he wasn't in the office. So, so he looked nothing like I expected, but that's to be expected, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, those guys were very good. Um, one of the things about a distributed company was that uh, we pretty much couldn't have junior engineers. Um, mm. Pretty much everybody had to be self-sufficient. Um, and they were. We had a really great staff. Um, so um, basically, if I didn't hear from somebody for a week, I assumed that they're making progress and not running into problems they couldn't handle. Because um, I had enough to do to uh, just kind of keep my head above water and deal with whatever problems did come up um, and dealing with other parts of the company. So, yeah, it was fun, but startups are a lot of work. <laughs> well, it's not questions on IRC. There, there's people finding references to websites that may or may not be the right things. Um, Sorry? Uh, somebody, I think, claims they found, well, this S&P spec story on the previous side, but I don't think it's a question. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I talked to the, the two guys doing S&P with some regularity, and when they came to interesting design decisions, we'd talk. But mm -hmm. they pretty much ran on their own, and they were good enough that I could trust them to do that. And we had a lot of other stuff going on, so... Um, so two guys pretty much did it, which is fairly impressive. Um, I, n I never ran the BSDI version in any kind of production. Um, I wasn't at BSDI anymore um, by the time they, um, well, it wasn't BSDI, it was Wind River, but. Yeah, like, like I can attest that um, a good chunk of, well, it's moved around now. Um, but for example, the propagate priority function in the turnstile code that used to be in the mutex code is mostly a direct lift of sh what came out of the, the BSDOS code originally. Um, although, in, in, yeah, it was like sync mosh step that C under like sysci3536 um, in the drop that we got and then kind of got moved to be machine independent and around. Mutex's work is still. Um, yeah, I don't remember if I talked to them at the time they were doing the priority propagation. Um, wouldn't have been at the top of my list, but they may have run into enough problems without it that they figured they had to do it, which wouldn't surprise me. Yep. And certainly when an interrupt thread needs a lock and exactly, something yeah. else holds it, um, you really kind of want that other thing to run to completion. So. Yeah, they, they got a lot done. Um, one of the other things that I was uh, proud of is the witness code. And I talked about doing the witness code. It was like, that's gonna be a lot of work, but you know, maybe it's worth it, so go ahead. No, actually that's that's actually something to call out because I know for a long time Linux didn't have something like that. Um, and that was we, we brought witness over directly from BSDOS and then at when we added other types of locks, we made sure we added witness support for it. 
Um, and it was very helpful. Like I can remember mm -hmm. Robert Watson talking about the fact that witness was a huge advantage. Right. And that, that is definitely straight from BSDOS. Yeah, it's certainly nice to know that deadly embraces are possible here yep. without having to debug the deadly embrace. Yes, and not just between two, like, uh, I think even at the time, uh, the BSDOS code had the con had the idea of like lock names. And so you didn't name like a process lock like by the PID, but they all shared the same name. So you could find potential relationships that you didn't have to have two physical locks reverse. You just had two locks of kind of the same logical class reverse right. and you could find, and it was very helpful. So yeah, that was, that, part of the that was something that was basically unsafe in the original system. Yep. Having two locks of the same type. Yep. So unless you defined an ordering, it's yes, it's going to collide eventually. Any other questions? Well, if not, let's thank Mike. And that means we're done for the day, um, aside from dinner, but dinner is a less formal affair. Um, so uh, you have time to just chill, hang out, or whatever you like to do. Uh, dinner is in the bottom floor of the residence hall in New Ottawa. Um, if you're not familiar with that, come. You can come find me or someone else will tell you how to get to the residence hall. Many of us are staying there. Uh, but in the bottom floor, you walk in the lobby. They are um, 